Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Clubhouse Show. This is Dave LaPointe along with my co-host, my panelist, Mike Lavalier, former catcher with the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Philadelphia Phillies, the St. Louis Cardinals, and the one and only, the fabulous Meatball. Gentlemen, how is it going tonight? I'm good. Um, it's great to be back. I know two weeks was way too long. Um, I know I hate to do shameless plugs, but I have to give a shout out. My girlfriend's stepfather, it is his birthday today. Happy birthday, Dave. Um, so let's get that out of the way so we can you can start ripping on me. I'm sure I've done something. Spanky, spanky, spanky. Let, let's, let's talk about the endless points that he's going to get for... Hey, li listen. Hey, Dave. Yeah, nice going, but um, is, does Dave listen to us? I think he's listening tonight, actually. Well, yeah. you know, happy birthday then, Dave. And, uh, you know, just remember that uh, we're doing our best to help out Meatball. We're, we're trying to make him sound as good as he possibly can. He got a couple weeks there where he's hot, but you just never know when it's going to turn around. Speaking of hot, speaking of hot, the Los Angeles Dodgers have come all the way back from nine and a half games down to tie the San Francisco Giants for first place in the National League West. Yeah, I think that, what was it, three weeks ago on June 8th, they were nine and a half games out, and you and I stated on this show that we may be looking at the end of the Don Mattingly era in, in uh, L.A., and let's face it, that's two years in a row now that the, uh, the Dodgers have put together this kind of run to go crazy. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and, and Spanky's following baseball long enough to know, and, I'm, and I've seen it happen plenty of times, that Dodgers have that right mix that... They can be malcontent in a second, in a heartbeat. They can turn this thing all around and go south. And I'm going to make a prediction and say now that the Dodgers have reached first place, one of these unhappy players on this team, one of these guys that, that, that might not be the best team player you've ever heard of, is going to do something wrong. And this team play, this team I love you attitude right now will turn around and the Dodgers will fall back down in the standings. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's a team full of chiefs. There's, you know, a bunch of guys on that team that are used to be in the center of attention. And whenever that vein one or two or half dozen of them uh, get, have something uh, that sticks in their craw, uh, they're going to become uh, a problem. And uh, that's something that the Dodgers are going to may have to worry about. Um, if they can keep it together, good gracious. They get a fabulous team, oh. and, and and you know without a doubt on paper they're they're beating the hell out of everybody on paper. But you you don't play the game on paper, and you got to have the guys uh, again uh, what I call worker bees that are going to be out there you know moving guys over, bunting guys over. So the Matt Kemp's and the Yasiel Puigs and and all the rest of those guys uh, can uh, you know get their limelight. But uh, again, these guys aren't used to sharing the limelight and and frankly uh, whenever one of them uh, gets uh, you know pushed aside uh, the, that's going to cause a tr uh, some trouble Adrian Gonzalez actually started the rally today by bunting to the to the third base where nobody was covering and uh, the pitcher Shelby Miller couldn't get over there to get it he actually bunted and then of course it went into a long Vince Scully <laughs> repertoire on Babe Ruth even bunted to get a base hit one time, and 20 minutes later we were done with that story, and, 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 and as great as Ben Scully is, I was kind of nodding off by the end of it at 1913. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, you got to love Ben, though. I mean, you got to love the guy. Um, you know, we've, we've well, been in the booth before, and, you know, just handling the, the, the color, color analyst uh, you know, part of my job is is working itself. But Vin does the play-by-play, -play, does the color. He throws out more facts than any dictionary, Wikipedia. Vin Scully invented Wikipedia, and they just talked to him about it, and that's how they end up coming up with Wikipedia. Well, Did the, you know that? The meatball just told the story that Vin Scully was going over the other day, and and a foul ball went into the stands. Brings up a story of whatever year it was. It was 1913. <laughs> and in a San Francisco, or excuse me, in a Cincinnati, New York Giants game, there was only one ball used in the entire game. <laughs> no home runs, no foul balls. And there was a foul by Ethier into the stand. You know, and it, <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Now, now, I mean, this sounds way off track here, and, and, and usually that's, that, that's the way I play, but if you're in solitary confinement in prison, 
why don't you pretend you're Vin Scully for about 10 years and come out and really know what you're doing? Because Vin basically is in solitary confinement up in the booth. Yeah, definitely in his own world. And uh, it's amazing that for three hours, yeah, he can just keep coming up with one thing after another after another. And, you know, it isn't a one-year gig. I mean, this, he's been doing this for a long, long time, all by his lonesome. When he starts talking about the sunset over Chavez Ravine, I, I, I curl up with a pillow on the couch and start reading a book. That never happens. He should narrate romance novels in the offseason. Oh, I think he does. Yeah. Vin Scully, the greatest. How about, you know what, in... in we played a long time, Meatball, and someday you're you're going to have this happen to you after you hit the home run in Yankee Stadium, 212 feet. <coughs> Bullshit. Um, when these announcers come up to, to talk to you the first time in your career, it's almost as a big of a thrill as when you get on the on the field for the first time and have your first bat or throw your first pitch. Uh, how about that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll take it you know, to a personal level. Uh, Harry Carey in Chicago. First time yeah, I get to Wrigley Field. Yeah, and before the game, and you know, I've you know, I've watched you know enough enough Cub games, you know, growing up, and you know, through the minor leagues, and gee whiz, you know, Harry Carey, and he comes walking over to me, and he's got these glasses. I, they, they look like two windshield white, just two uh, separate windshields that he's got on. I mean, they're they're four foot by six foot on both sides. And, and and here he comes over. They have wipers. <laughs> and, and they, they, they they've got a they've got a guy that walks around with a squeegee and then just squeegees his glasses as he spills beer on them. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, he comes over and and like shakes his hand and you know introduces himself and I was just like for me that was kind of like holy shit I've made it to the big leagues. Harry Carey just introduced himself to me. Oh you know I was uh, well coming up when I came up with the Brewers. I had Bob Euchre and Merle Harmon were the two announcers for the for them, and then I get over to the Cardinals and there's Jack Buck and Mike Shannon, and sometimes when you talk to these guys, it just you forget where you know. Thank you for your time this time. Until next time, this has been the St. Louis Cardinals, and you just I'm a part of this now, and it's just it's just unbelievable when you finally do. Hey, did Harry butcher your name? <laughs> I couldn't tell. I was playing. Uh, but, but I mean, but somebody yeah, had the tape. Uh, I must have yeah, said yeah. if he butchered your name uh, or not. I, I, I put it this way: I bet you he probably he probably Here's got it right. Here's Mike Lavalia, all your ear. Uh, I, I, I think uh, Andres Galarraga had the probably the best. Uh, Andres, uh, all they call him the big cat. <laughs> that was uh, that was that was Harry. But uh, he, yeah, he lost the ball in the sun. He's from an island. He's from the Dominican Republic. How can you lose a ball in the sun? <laughs> I think Steve Stone, didn't he have it in his contract that, that he could only correct Harry maybe once a week or something like that? Because Stone would just sit there and Harry would just butcher these names when I was growing up. And it would just and it, it would just hysterical when Stone would just try to come back in and re-pronounce the name the correct way and try to segue into the back into the game. The, uh, the, one, my first shutout in, uh, in, uh, with the Cardinals in baseball was against the Mets. I beat them one nothing in Shea Stadium. So, of course, I made it onto the Kiner's Corner. And you know Ralph, Ralph would tip a few, you know, during the game, and, and he didn't hide it, you know. So I get down, I, you know, you get a headset, you're down on the field. Ralph's talking to you from the booth, and you know, uh, we like to welcome Dave Lapointe up to Kiner's Kiner, and you, you know, you hear the little goofs that go on. Uh, Dave, you had a good time out there. Uh, Mookie Brooks and Hubie Wilson really didn't do too much against you tonight, and you're going, I'm not going to correct them on air. I'm just going to go <laughs> along with it. And you know that you you find that sometimes like uh, the old PA guy for the Boston Red Sox, the guy with the deep grassy voice, you know, he you know he liked to enjoy a scotch or two up there, and you know, you go Pedro Sally number six, you know, and, and you could not understand them most of the time, but when you got to meet these guys in person, like the PA announcer for the Twins uh, in the old uh, Metrodome, Minnesota, he used to stand right behind home plate. They had like one of those, it looked like a big air tunnel next to it, and then he was standing there. You know, and this guy, metronome rules, prohibit smoking in the metronome, please. No smoking! And you're on the mound, and you know he's going to say it. So, like, you step off, and, like, you're watching the PA guy work, you know. So, you know, he used to go through his lineups, you know, and, and, and at the end would say the pitcher, and, you know, pitching for the Twins, he's a left-hander, Frank Viola. And, you know, like, I walk out and I go, can you one time, like, do for the visitor? Can you, like, say I'm a left-hander out there? He goes, I love you. Yeah, I'll do it for you. You know, and uh, pitching for the White Sox, he's a left-hander, Dave Lapointe. You know, like you're on the mound, like you know, pointing to the guy, like high-fiving, and in meeting these guys in the major leagues is is better than. Well, 
pretty close to to a tie of of, of being as good as is getting there. Well, you know, and and uh, I think everybody has their own, you know. Uh, guys that they follow, uh, whether it be a musician, you know, an actor. I mean, these are the guys that we followed as kids. You know, these were guys that, that we listened to, and, and it was amazing. You know, Ken Harrelson, whenever I ended up with the White Sox, you know, the Hawk, and uh, he played for the you know, the Red Sox whenever I was a kid, and then uh, whenever I went over to, uh, you know, the White Sox, you know, just getting a chance to meet him, talk to him, play golf with him, and, you know, like I said, these are, you know, Boyhood uh, uh, memories that came to life, and you know, all of us that you know made it to the big leagues. I think you know that was part of the you know the whole gig. It was yeah, it was great being on the field, but you know all the different things that that uh, go along with that. You know, just uh, it was just uh, mind blowing at times. Paul Harrelson, the first guy to ever wear batting gloves, and it happened by mistake because he played a little golf in the morning and had a little <laughs> blister on the hand, so he wore a golf glove out the first time, and it and it really helped him. So. Uh, after that, we soon had batting gloves, and uh, he played back in the day a Richie Dick Allen, who just made batting gloves and wristbands look cooler than anybody in the history of the game. I, when I was with the White Sox, I was lucky enough to have Frank Messer, who was the original with the Yankees back. You know, it, they're all-time great announcers, and Don Drysdale. Like when Don Drysdale is announcing, Don Drysdale comes down to talk to you after or before the game. What are you going to say? Uh, yes, Mr. Drysdale, what do you want me to do tonight? Uh, you had 56 scoreless innings, did you? You're a big man. I'm going to do whatever you tell me. Like, some of them are intimidating. Joe Torre used to announce for the Angels, nicest guy in the world. You know, you like, you, was that Joe Torre that was just that nice to me? You know, you, you get to see these guys in, in uh, Coleman out in San Diego. You know, uh, these guys that, you know, what a thrill to meet these guys. And they're as big a, a part of the game in the history of baseball as any player that's ever played the game. All right, we're going to go to a little break right now. We're going to go to the meatball. He's going to give us a rundown on the scores for today. Uh, once again, you are listening to the Clubhouse Show. Dave LaPoy, Michael Bowyer, the meatball. Take it on over. All right, guys. Let's take a look around baseball with your scores and highlights. We'll start in the American League. The White Sox 4, Toronto 0. Jose Quintana was very sharp today. Allowed three hits and two walks, striking out seven and seven shutout innings to beat Mark Burley. In the first place, Jays. Burley drops to 10-5 and five on the season. Moise Sierra hit a second home run of the season and had two hits to lead the Sox. Tampa Bay 12, Baltimore 7. Pitching was a huge priority in this contest at Camden Yards. The Rays belted five homers, including two by Matt Joyce, who was 5-6 for six on the day. Alex Cobb gave up three earned runs and five innings to get the win as the Rays take three or four from the O's. Ryan Flaherty and Manny Machado also homered in the loss. Kansas City 5. L.A. 4, Omar Infante broke a 4-4 tie with a walk-off RBI single in ninth to give the Royals the win. Jason Greeley gives up the hit and takes the loss in only a third of an inning. Eric Ibar and Cole Calhoun homered in the loss for the Angels. 6-4, Houston beats Detroit. Scott Feldman shut down the hot Tigers offense by giving up only two runs in six innings. Matt Dominguez had three hits, as did Carlos Corporan. Drew Smiley gave up four earned runs in two and a third. Minnesota 3, Texas 2. Kyle Gibson was solid, giving up two runs in eight to get the win. Kendris Morales doubled home. Sam Fold at the top of the ninth to break the tie. Glenn Perkins worked the ninth for his 20th save. Seattle 3, Cleveland 0. Felix Hernandez went off today, went eight innings, gave up one hit, striking out nine. Fernando Rodney finished off the ninth to record his 23rd save. Robinson Cano homered in the sixth to seal the win. That's 10-2 and two for King Felix. And the American League also tonight, we will have Boston and the Yankees. John Lackey will go versus Chase Whitley. In the National League, Atlanta 3, Philly 2. Aaron Harang allowed two runs and scattered 11 hits over seven innings as the Braves swept the four-game series against the now last-place Philadelphia Phillies. Marlon Byrd had two solo home runs in a losing effort, and Craig Kimbrell worked the ninth to pick up his 24th save. Pittsburgh 5, New York Mets 2. The Pirates got three in the first, and that was enough for Edison Volquez to beat the Mets. Pedro Alvarez hit a two-run home in the fourth to lead the Pirates. Bartolo Colon gave up five runs in six innings, and in a really sad note, his two-game hitting streak came to an end as he was 0 for 2 with two strikeouts. Colorado 10, Milwaukee 4. Jorge De La Rosa got the win, even though he threw three wild pitches. Six innings with four earned runs was good enough to get the W. Giovanni Gallardo gave up five earned runs and eight total runs over five innings to take the loss. Ryan Braun hit his 11th home run in the loss. Cincinnati 4, San Francisco 0. Homer Bailey flirted with his third career no-hitter as he went uh, six and a third without giving up a hit, but he ended up giving up three hits and going complete with uh, seven strikeouts to get his win. Tim Hudson gave up two earned runs and eight to take the loss for the Giants who are now tied for first with the Dodgers. The Dodgers win 6-0. Clayton Kershaw struck out 13 over seven innings as the Dodgers take 3-4 from the Cardinals. Andre Ethier homered to power the win. 
just final, San Diego 2-1 to one over Arizona. And an interleague play, Oakland 4, Miami 3. Tommy Malone was steady and allowed two runs over seven innings as the A's complete the three-game sweep in Miami. Nate Freeman was just called up and hit a three-run homer to lead the A's offense. The A's are now 51-30 and 30 and own the best record in Major League Baseball. That's a look around the scores and highlights. Let's go back to Dave and Spanky and see what we got going on with the rest of Major League Baseball, guys. We are back on the Clubhouse Show. Dave LaPointe, Mike LaValliere, the fabulous meatball here with a microphone in front of us and our good buddy Fernando with a whole table full of stuff over there in front of him making sure this gets off. And, and gentlemen, uh, proud to say this is the first week that we are going uh, streaming and, uh, and archiving through YouTube. And uh, hopefully it makes it a little bit easier for people to listen and, uh, and get a hold of us and, and, and watch it uh, or listen to it tomorrow if they didn't have the chance to uh, listen to it tonight. Spanky, I want to get on something that uh, me and you talked about during the week. And uh, as, we, as we call it, Rule 7 dash or dot 13 and we talked about it two weeks ago and we talked about an incident with Buster Posey and and me and you both have a different uh, we have the same look at Buster Posey different from a lot of people in baseball and I want to go back to that day and, and I think what you said in in the way that you know they take him out of game precautionary reasons because he got hit by a, a swing and a, and, and a backswing the Giants since that day have played such bad baseball, and that is why they are back tied with the Dodgers. And I think it's come to a point where the guy that was supposed to be that team leader, now, now don't get me wrong, this guy is one of the best hitters in baseball and, and probably always will be. As for toughness, as for the guy that's going to take charge, as for a leader on that team, he is not that guy. And in and, 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 and my mind, the reason that Rule 7-13 was put into play is strictly for Buster Posey. Well, Buster Posey got hurt, and he was in a poor position, and uh, they all of a sudden, I don't know who came up with this rule, but they decided that we need to protect the catchers and there shouldn't be contact at home plate. Let me interrupt you one second. Now, I want to go back to when he got hurt, and now you've seen that play over and over. I've always said from the get-go, the reason he got hurt is because he wanted no part of a collision. Well, he, he was, was in a, no position to receive that ball. Yeah, yeah, he was in a bad position to start with, and yeah, yeah, he was trying to avoid contact. And uh, you know, that's uh, again, I've I've heard it uh, around in spring training from catchers, and it kind of makes me want to puke. Uh, catchers, well, we, why should we give up our body, you know, uh, just for just for a game? Uh, and uh, you know, I I hear that attitude, and I just like, well, you know what? The, then don't be a catcher. Uh, go find something else to do. Uh, you know, that's to me, that's part of the game. Uh, it's what you signed up for. Uh, I didn't have a choice, and there's probably a lot of catchers that don't have a choice uh, of playing that position. Uh, I was signed as a third baseman, and thank goodness the uh, Philadelphia Phillies uh, decided that my short little squatty body wasn't going to hit more home runs than Mike Schmidt. That rule uh, is you had to be taller than a bag, uh, than a base. Well. <laughs> Well, I was slightly taller back then. I'm I'm starting to shrink now. Uh, I'm I'm on the please, please uh, say no. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah. So um, you know the 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 whole thing was was designed this rule designed to stop contact. And um, you know as far as I'm concerned, all it had to be was was just refined to where there was unnecessary contact either by the catcher or the runner, and the young player's discretion. You know that yeah, safer out unnecessary contact you know play uh, at the plate where you know, there's no chance of the of uh, of getting the uh, runner out and the catcher is just sitting on top of home plate okay yeah the runner's safe okay you got to have it both ways but now if if the catcher is maybe in front of home plate and uh, the the runner has a chance to slide Okay, then if there's contact, yeah, the runner's out because unnecessary contact. I, I understand that. It's to take away the cheap shot. But what has happened right now? Kind of like common sense rule. Yeah, well, you know what? That, the common sense is out, out the door. Right. And I tell you, uh, rule 7.13, as it was stated, we talked about it in spring training. Uh, get together with Jeff Bannister, the uh, bench coach of the uh, Pirates. He kind of handles all of the catchers, Russ Martin. And, uh, you know, we, we get together and we decided – you know, hey, well, the only way we can do it is do it the way you normally would do it and let the umpire be the bad guy. Well, we found out two weeks ago 
uh, in between our last show and right now, it's happened two times or three times to where it's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, last week, uh, play at the plate, uh, bases loaded in Pittsburgh, PNC Park. Uh, Pirates are in the field. Uh, guy hits a tapper with the bases loaded just to the right of the mound. Uh, pitcher comes up, picks it up, throws it home. Well, now it's going to be a kind of a bang-bang play. As a catcher, you've got to have your foot on on the plate, and this is a force play. Well, Russell Martin is in pretty good position. The throw kind of takes him into the batter's box a little bit. He catches it and does like a reverse uh, backflip. You know, just it stays on the ground but rolls back to avoid contact. Right. Okay, the bat, the runner is out. There's no question. I'll buy a long ball, shot. Uh, force play. Yeah, not even. So now... Uh, the uh, uh, manager uh, Price from uh, Cincinnati goes ahead and he goes to home plate and wants to challenge it. And I'm going, well, <laughs> this is the silliest thing I've ever seen. There's no chance that this challenge will ever stand up. That it just that's foolish. You're making a mockery of the game. In fact, Price should get uh, fined for for that bullshit. Okay, I didn't like it at all. Okay, that's gamesmanship. That's horseshit. Right. I don't like it. Right. Okay. So now it goes to New York. And it comes back, and Jerry Lane's the uh, the crew chief, and then he gives the safe signal. Well, as you can imagine, Clint Hurdle gets tossed. Okay, I, I did, did it, you get thrown out of the bar you were at? I, you know, I was at home. Thank God I was at home. Okay, it, it would have been Judy three out of the it, man cave. Uh, yeah, Judy, get, look, get on the back porch. I'm going to put you on the dog run for a little bit. I want you to run around crazy, and when, when you get tired, I'll, I'm going to give you a bowl of water, and then you can run around some more because I was pissed. I'm still pissed. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Charlotte, so, can we get a bowl of water over here and a little so, dog run? All right. So, so here's the deal. So so now I'm, I, I go I, I go to you know looking at at my Twitter account at, at Spanky Catches and Buster Olney, uh, one of the uh, uh, gurus from ESPN, uh, writes down and this is the next day after I had a chance to somewhat cool off and he says, uh, well you know in the big picture the rule is working because none of the catchers are getting hurt. Well number one bullshit. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're your facts. There's as many catchers on the DL as there ever was, maybe for something else, but you know what? Catchers are still getting hurt, okay? And I said, so the big picture, what, what, what's the big picture here? That, you know, you, you've made a mockery of the game? I says the the rule is designed for to avoid contact. It's not designed so catchers can't play defense, and that's what uh, ultimately is what's happening. Um, so Clint Hurdle gets tossed. Uh, he, you know, gets on the phone, talks to Joe Torre, and Joe Torre, good baseball guy, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, very experienced in the... And a uh, catcher. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, guy that's, you know, in the commissioner's office, and he looks at it, and, and thank God, somebody from baseball decided that, you know, th this needs to be rewritten, and it has been rewritten, you know, uh, to where the rule 7.13 does not, uh, it cannot be applied to force plays, uh, if you know those criteria are met, where you know the the catcher isn't you know blocking home plate without the ball, so I mean they've they've somewhat fixed it, but it was something that didn't need to be fixed to start with. It was just a common sense thing. If you send out a memo, look, any contact at home plate that doesn't involve a play, you know, you're going to get tossed for it, and you can be deemed safe or out depending on who you are. Okay, and that's just the way it is. So, I, I, I mean, I got pissed. I go, you know, who's making these calls? Well, I come to find out it's regular umpires right. in New York that are making these calls. And I'm like, what can you possibly be thinking about? And now, okay, whenever a, I, I want to know who's making the call because as a catcher, okay, and you're not, you, you're not protecting me here and you're, you know, causing me to lose a ball game, you know that ball in the dirt that I blocked for you? Well, guess what? You know, I might not block the next one. Right. This is this is this has turned into bullshit. So so you know what? Let's have the umpire that's making the call in New York. Let's get his balls on the line and let's have his name out there saying I'm the one that overturned this. You are you are you know, never going to have the no, identification you, you, of the guy overturning the call. Well, you know what? And that's and that in itself is bullshit. You know, I I don't like you know the, this whole thing you know about the replay. I think there are some times whenever, yeah, it can make some sense. But, you know, overall, I haven't met anybody or talked to anybody that likes the replay rule. Fans hate it. There's no flow in the game. I mean, it's tough enough as a, as a, as a baseball guy to, to where, 
you know, we're always looking for fans. And I always hear, you know, fans don't like the game because there's not the same flow as some of the other sports. Hockey, basketball, uh, even soccer has flow compared to baseball. Baseball is a lot of start, stop, okay? And, and it, you know, and, and that's one of the things is now you've even taken whatever flow you've had, you've taken that out with the challenge rule. So, you know, to me, I, they've, they've hurt the game. You were uh, you were in Ireland when. Oh, we... Hold on a second. <sighs> okay, now I'm back. That, that was that was Take almost like that, that was a, over a, a half a, a mile. Sip. Over a half a mile. Well, on my, that my my microphone is glowing red right now. <laughs> have a sip. Have a sip. I'm gonna have. You a were in sip. Ireland when Jim McKeon was on. What is the last time? And and we asked him if Joe West has the base has the call that you're going to call in and possibly overturn it. And that crew that's work not working that weekend in New York. So you've got a younger guy. Well, everybody's younger than Joe West when it comes to time of service. You're going to overturn the call that Joe West just made. And I asked Jim McKeon, I said, do you think that will ever come into play, that some guy won't overturn a call because he's going to have to answer to Joe West next time he sees him? He goes, I can see that happening. So already, as I say, um, umpires make judgment calls, right? The guys in New York on the instant replay are making judgment calls. Now, somebody told me, and we might want to look this up. Somebody out there, you guys listening to the show, is there a rule in baseball that says the tie goes to the runner? I've always been told that no, that it doesn't exist in the, in, in the rule book anywhere that the tie goes to the umpire's judgment. Um, so I can't, I can't confirm that. I don't know it 100%, but everyone that I've ever talked to, no one has ever been able to point me into the rule book that says, here's the rule that says tie on the base, goes to the runner. You know, and, and the reason things are overturned now is inconclusive evidence, like in, in a National Football League, otherwise known as we don't have the right camera angle, or there's no way, how can you see inside of a first baseman's glove and say that the ball has not hit the back of his glove by the time the guy touches the base? There's a lot of things wrong with that. All right, we're going to touch on a few of these things when we come back. Uh, right now, I'm going to take a little break, give it over to the meatball, and he's going to talk about uh, the standings, and, and uh, they, they seem to be changing one way, and... and uh, and go in the other direction than the others. Hey, Meatball, why don't you uh, take it over give us something, will you, Bill? I might be able to handle that. All right, guys, let's take a look around the baseball world and the American League. We're going to start in the East. Still in first place, the Toronto Blue Jays. They are a game and a half up, and in second place is the Yankees and Baltimore, both a game and a half back. Um, both of them, uh, the Blue Jays have lost three games in a row, but have still held on to that lead in the division. Boston now six and a half back. The Rays took three of four from the Orioles and are now ten games back, 14 games under. Still rocking that pretty poor record in baseball, but uh, making a little bit of noise uh, in the cellar. In the Central, we had a flip-flop. Uh, the week off that we had, Kansas City went on a run and took over first place. But this week, Detroit won eight in a row before they lost the other day, and uh, now Detroit is back on top first place. They've won eight out of ten. They are three and a half games up on the Royals. They are six and a half games up on Cleveland. They are seven and a half up on the Chicago White Sox, who have won three in a row as well. And Minnesota is in last place, eight games out. That division is still anybody's ball game. Out west, the Oakland A's seem to be running away with the division. They are 51 and 30, five and a half games up. They rock the best record in Major League Baseball. They've won four games in a row. They're 12 games over on the road. They've done everything right out there. They have a 98.9% chance of making the playoffs as of right now. In second place, Los Angeles Angels, five and a half games out. Seattle's in third with seven and a half games out. Texas slipping. They had lost eight in a row earlier this week before they won when they're two and eight in their last ten. They are 14 games out and only two games ahead of the Astros, making a little noise to climb out of the cellar. Over in the National League, the Atlanta Braves hold on to that slim margin in the, a in the NL East. They are a half game up on the Washington Nationals, even though the Braves have won four games in a row. The Nationals won a, a pair in a row, and they are like I said, a half game back. In third place, the Miami Marlins. They are five games out, although they have lost four games in a row. The Mets are seven out, and the Phillies, as a result of losing four in a row, are now in last place, eight games out of first. In the Central, Milwaukee just keeps on winning and keeps on winning. They are now six and a half games out into a second-place tie with the Cincinnati Reds and the St. Louis Cardinals. The Reds won five in a row and eight out of ten and are now creeping back into making that a race. In fourth place, Pittsburgh Pirates, eight games out, and Chicago Cubs, 15 games out of first place in last place. Out west, as we said, the Dodgers have come back after three weeks being nine and a half games out and have tied the top of the division with the San Francisco Giants. Giants have lost four in a row and seven out of ten, 
and the Dodgers have tied them and topped the division. Colorado in third place with 10 games out. San Diego 11 games out. And in last place, the Arizona Diamondbacks, who are now tied with the Rays for the worst record in baseball at 12 games out. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at MyClubhouseShow.com. Follow Mike Lavalier at Spanky Catches, at Dave LaPointe, and I'm at Mr. Meatball Says. Check us out online. Send us your questions. Send us your comments. We would love to hear from you guys. Back to you. We are back on the Clubhouse Show. Dave LaPointe, Mike Lavalier, the Meatball, Fernando pushing all the right buttons over there. And speaking of pushing all the right buttons, uh, good comments coming back from people listening. A heck of a lot easier to get on the show this week being uh, aired over YouTube. And, uh, Fernando, we appreciate you changing over, and it sure looks like it's making things a lot easier. Hell yeah. Now, if we could just get live photos of, of Spanky's last speech, if we can get that on YouTube. I mean, if, if, he, if he gave four more speeches like that, he could catch an old-timers game by the All-Star break. Yeah, I think that I would love to have it on television because I think that at that time we could use John Madden the Telestrator drawing the fire coming out of his mouth from from the screen when, the, the way that he was he was going on that. Still pissed. Still pissed. Good. It's, you now, should be. A, you know, it's it, a bullshit rule. It, it's mockery. It, it really is. I mean, it, it just, you know, it, it's it's a rule that was designed for the pussy catchers, okay, that are out there right it, now. It, that it is strictly uh, designed for Buster Posey well, and nobody else. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to be as nice as I can, you know. Uh, cause Who else bu bu Buster's on my fantasy team. And so I, I kind of have to manage them, like, in my own head the right way. But, you know, gosh, you know what? Man up, dude. It, it's just man same, up. It's you know, thing, and that's enough. Same thing I said a long, long time ago. Who was that person that complained that we needed instant replay? Who, who's all these people that are saying baseball is broken? I don't think it is. I think it's reporters. I don't think it's fans. I think it's reporters. And I think, you know, reporters have the power of the pen. They always do. They always will. And they, they what they want done they're going to get done because they can they can print it in every story and they can fabricate saying I've talked to a fan out there and he really wants this change made and they can sell it without having actual proof that it needs to be sold. Sure, sure. Um, oh, by the way, I, you know, going back to um, you know, I, I'm going to change it and kind of go backwards just a little bit here. Um, you know, on the replay officials. Okay, what's a, to me? Okay, you got Bob Davidson. Okay, and Bach and Bob Davidson has always wanted to be in the limelight. Do you not think that he dreams of going to New York to overturn a call? I would, I would bet dollars to donuts, okay, that that Bob Davidson is overturning calls in New York whenever he gets a chance just to do it. I mean, that that's the way this guy operates. And and Bob was a, was a good guy. I never had any problems with him, other than the fact that he always wanted to be in the limelight. And and to me, you know, I want to see. Okay, number one, what umpire is getting the most calls overturned? And if he's the one that's getting the most calls overturned, he should be denied access to New York to be able to overturn other guys' calls. What the hell does he know? He's getting most of his calls o overturned. There, There is a stat out. We can go to – what's the name of that website, Meatball? Uh, BaseballSavant.com, I think. Savant, S-A-V-A-N-T. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, and we looked to see, like, calls and who's made this call and who's that. But – I, I will kind of I, I hate to say I kind of disagree with you. Whoa, about, whoa, about whoa, Bob. hey, hey, and the hey! Reason, hold on, the, and the reason that I say it is because and you said it exactly. Bob Davidson is looking for the limelight. I think Bob Davidson looks to make the Leslie Nielsen type naked gun call on the field because he wants to be seen. Nobody knows if Bob's doing it in in, in the booth. Sure. You know? And so so may, maybe maybe Bob to me seems like the kind of guy that wants to be on the field making the call and not and not behind closed doors because if nobody knows who it is, Bob doesn't get his glory. See, now I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I came up through the minor leagues. I came all the way up through with Bob Davidson. And I got to know Bob Davidson quite a bit because obviously Bob Davidson likes to have a few cocktails after the game every now and then. Shocker. And I, I have imbibed once or twice in my life, and, and we used to kind of hang out. And Bob Davidson was not a bad guy off the field, actually a really good guy off the field. Bob Davison was that guy when he first came up. He made enough bad calls and enough bad judgment calls that he was in a lot of arguments, you know. But Bob Davison didn't have the common sense to, if you were wrong, back out of the argument and 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 let's let's move on. Bob wanted to get back in your face, in which he was good at it, and he he can argue with the best of them. But um, it goes back. I I don't know if Bob is that guy that that's going to do that. I think I think Angel Hernandez would be that guy that wants to, to uh, take charge no matter where he is. And, uh, you know, 
get Angel up in that booth and see what he does. Well, like I said, whoever it is, I mean, they should be uh, qualified, to, you know, and, and I don't care if it's, if it's, you know, a crew chief or, you know, who it is that's, that's making these calls. But, you know, if you get, you know, whatever, 10 calls overturned, uh, you can't make any, you know, judgments in New York. I, I don't know how you fix that, but, I mean, it, it just seems to, you know, my point that, you know, it just, uh, these guys are making these calls that just don't make any sense whatsoever. And, and that's, that's what I said all along. You know, we, once it goes back to the replay booth and with that slow motion film footage they have, you still can't make a call. So now it's their judgment. You've turned, you've taken a judgment call on the field from a, a great umpire, and you've given it to a judgment call in a TV booth to a great umpire. Why do we need it? It's the same exact thing. You notice, Spanky, they are not doing uh, instant replay or judgment call on check swings. Now, isn't that a judgment call? Oh, absolutely. It's just like everything else. Why not have it on check swings? Because we'd slow the game down? You know, <laughs> we, we, we worried about slowing the game down, and as Christopher Mad Dog Russo said on his show, if you're a fan of the game, why do you want less of a game? You want more of the game. You want to see more of it. Why slow it down? So why are we doing that? Who's the one complaining? Yeah, the, you know what? You know Me and you, it? because we get a little bit thirsty about the seventh <laughs> inning of every ball game, and it's time to start looking for a cocktail. But other than that, who else wants this game to get over with? The, the writers. The writers. The writers. Because they gotta they got to make deadline. Right. That's a, that, that's the, the writers, you know, that they they would rather have a two-hour game than a three-hour game. Do writers they, make you know, or break baseball? Well, you know, I tell you one thing. What they can do is they can make or break teams and players, managers, coaches. Well, here's I mean, here's... These, these are guys that, you know, there's a lot of poison in ink. And, uh, you know, there's uh, what, what can uh, – Bill Jepp can also tear you down. And uh, you know, that's something that I think over the course of the years that, you know, we've, we've known guys that we can trust – and we know guys that you know you can't say anything in front of them, and uh, you know those those guys. I mean, they uh, they have a lot to say about you know how you're perceived, you know, with uh, with with, with uh, you know within your own fan base. Here's something to look at, though. We all know newspapers. The sale of newspapers are going down, 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 down because of the internet. All right, technology is helping a lot of people. It's killing the newspaper industry. Pretty soon, these guys are not writing their columns for the newspaper. The only thing you're going to be able to get is when you go to a team's website and you're going to follow that beat reporter that just happens to work for MLB that's filing that report. That's the guy that that's going to be you're going to be reading about. So pretty soon, we don't have the Verducci's and guys like that that have the national power to change baseball. And I and I'll be happy when that happens because now we'll go back and maybe get it in the players' hands, the general manager's hands, the manager's hands, guys like that. Put it back in the commissioner's hand, but as you stated to me earlier, the commissioner has just made another gaffe that we're going to remember him for a little Wait, bit. The used car salesman? Yeah. 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 Well, the uh, infamous uh, Bud Seal again. Uh, this goes back uh, back whenever I was a, a player rep um, back in the tumultuous late 80s and 90s when there was a Can lot of Can I get of, a lot spelling on that word? Tumultuous? Yeah. Uh, I, I, words like that, I, I've never used in my life. It, so. it, it uh, rhymes with remultuous. Okay. So anyway, um, as a player rep, okay, you had Bud Selig, who was an owner. Okay, the owner was then voted to be commissioner. The commissioner's job is for the integrity of the game, and for you know, just basically overseeing things and making things right. Well, you just we had just gone through collusion. We had had uh, uh, all kinds of you know problems with lockouts. We had a strike in '94. This is the most horrible thing. But the the commissioner is supposed to be somebody that's independent from both parties, from the players' association as well as the owners. Okay. Well, since the you know, whatever it was, uh, whenever he took over, then basically you've had an owner as the commissioner. Two weeks ago. His Milwaukee Brewers, which he's uh, still uh, owner of, traded Brad Mills, a guy that's a decent pitcher, a guy that's uh, good enough to uh, be a starting pitcher on the first place Oakland A's. Okay, traded them from the Brewers to the Oakland A's for one dollar. For one dollar, okay, that's a mockery. 
that should not happen. I don't know. That's you one, know, one, uh, one 560,000th of a salary. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, that to me, uh, I remember uh, Bowie Kuhn or, you know, there, there were some, uh, some commissioners back there, uh, Bart Giamatti. Uh, you know that that stood up and said, you know, this is wrong. I, I remember as a kid, the Red Sox made a, a a trade with Oakland A's, and the Oakland A's were disbanding, and we had gotten like Catfish Hunter, Joe Rudy, and somebody else. I say we as all of us Red Sox fans as a kid, and the commissioner came in and said, no, that's a that's a bad trade. It's it's not in the interest of the best things for baseball. Well, that is no longer the case. Anytime you can trade a guy for a dollar, and now he's in the starting rotation with the Oakland A's, I, he, that that's just uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I, I think both. I think both Charlie Finley and George Steinbrenner both tried to trade somebody for a dollar and was rejected. You know, the last one I remember the big one is when they traded Chuck Tanner for Manny Sanguin. They traded the manager for a player, and that one wasn't going to go through. And they went to court, and they got that overturned that they could do that. Uh, if I could find a good lawyer around here, you know, maybe we can go back in and look at some of these things. And if I could find a really, really good lawyer here in the Tampa area, I'm going to look for one. Yeah, yeah you know, you, no, there's one sitting right across well, the table yeah, from me. I, I, I was going to say, um, you can look for a good lawyer anywhere. You're not going to find a good one. You're going to find a competent one, but they're not going to be any good lawyer around. I'm sorry. I, I, I've looked and looked and looked. I'm 53 years old, going on 54. I haven't found a good lawyer yet. Yeah, yeah, I said it. I, I guess I haven't either because I've been in court for the last 23 years. I, I need to. I finally started. I finally had a late uh, season winning streak, so maybe that worked out good. All right, we are uh, we're having a bunch of good stuff to talk about tonight. Um, but every once in a while, we have to take a break. You're listening to the Clubhouse Show, Mike Lavalier, Dave Lapointe. We're going to turn it over to the Meatball, and he's going to go over the uh, league leaders and some stats. All right, right back in a minute. All right, guys, let's start in the American League. Your batting average leader, Jose Altuve, batting 347 after one monstrous week this week. Uh, Adrian Beltre of the Texas Rangers hitting 332 in second, and Victor Martinez, 323 in third place. Your home run leader, Edwin Encarnacion, with 25. He's also tied with Nelson Cruz and Jose Abreu. Both have 25 as well. In the RBI, Nelson Cruz, 66. Edwin Encarnacion, 65. And tied for third, Miguel Cabrera and Jose Abreu, have 64. Your American League wins leader, Masahiro Tanaka, the New York Yankees, has 11 wins. King Felix Hernandez has 10. Mark Burley and Rick Porcello of the Tigers are also tied with 10. Your ERA leader, Masahiro Tanaka, 2.10. It's also tied with King Felix, 2.10. Hugh Darvish of the Texas Rangers, the lone bright spot on that team, 2.42 in third place. Your saves leader in the American League, are Greg Holland and Fernando Rodney, both with 23. Batting average leader for the team is the Detroit Tigers. They are hitting collectively 276. Oakland A's leading runs. They have 414 runs scored. The team pitching, Oakland has a 3.18 ERA. And the Tampa Bay Rays in last place, but do have the most strikeouts in baseball at 725. Over the National League, Torrey Tulewitzki still leads at 353. Jonathan Lucroy in second at 334. Matt Adams, first baseman of the St. Louis Cardinals, having a nice year at hitting 325. Your home run leader in the National League, Giancarlo Stanton with 21. Troy Tulowitzki has 18. And tied for third, Todd Frazier and Anthony Rizzo of the Cubs with 17. Your RBI leader, Giancarlo Stanton with 60. Justin Morneau of the Rockies has 58. And Paul Goldschmidt in Arizona with 53. Three-way tie atop the league lead for wins. Adam Wainwright, Zach Grinke, and Alfredo Simon of the Reds all have 10 victories. Your ERA leader in the National League still Johnny Cueto, 1.88. Adam Wainwright, 2.01. And Josh Beckett having a one heck of a year bouncing back at 2.11. Saves leader in the National League, Frankie Rodriguez with 27. Three-way tie for second, Kenley Jansen, Trevor Rosenthal, and Craig Kimbrell all with 24. Your team batting average leader is your Colorado Rockies, 283. They also lead in runs, 405 runs for the season. Your pitching leader, Washington Nationals, now have a 3.07 ERA to lead the way. And the Los Angeles Dodgers have 701 strikeouts to lead the league. That's a look at the stats as we have this week. Like As, as always, follow us at My Clubhouse Show. You can follow me at Mr. Meatball Says. That's Pinky Catches F. Dave LaPointe all the way around. Send us your comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Back to you. And we are back at the Clubhouse Show. Uh, Dave LaPointe, Mike LaVallier. You just listened to the Meatball 
Chris Stansberry, and, and we are sneaking up on that time of the year, Spanky, where we are getting closer to the All-Star Game. And um, I've been watching closely the, the events that are leading up to this Home Run Derby contest. And I am making a bold prediction this year. We're going to have a first in the history of baseball that I think Tula Whiskey is going to get hurt <laughs> during the Home Run Derby contest. And we'll have another rule put in next year that we will not have. You know, you can only have someone. They already cut down the outs from, I think, 10 to 7 or something like that because the, the hitters are getting a little tired, a little exhausted for taking batting practice. And Tula Whiskey right now, he, he jogs from base to base. He doesn't play hard ever. He's hitting... 390 or whatever the hell he's hitting, a useless 390 because you can't score him with a double. And what I think is going to happen here, here's my prediction. <clears throat> Giancarlo is going to win, and and I think uh, McGahee is going to come off the bench, pinch hit, base hit, two RBIs will be the MVP, and the National League will have the home field advantage in the World Series, which, again, I think is a joke that the fans vote on who plays the game, but the winner of the game determines who's got home field advantage of the World Series, which is huge for the players, and the fans control that, which I think is wrong. Granted, and I get reminded by people all the time, the fans are the people that pay the salaries, absolutely, and the, and the advertiser pays the salaries, I agree with that, but this is the World Series we're talking about, and I think merit should go to the best record during the season of who gets home field advantage. Well, uh Sorry about that. I turned off my microphone by accident. It's the first thing them short fingers ever reached outside the lines. Actually, you know what? I saw the meatball over by my microphone in the, in the break. He was reaching over. Um, maybe the meatball is trying to turn me off. I, I don't know. Maybe well, for me. You know, you know what? Before, Anything named meatball close to you in the first place Okay. Is okay. All right. So let me just... We'll go back to this all-star thing, but just let me just get a little meatball thing here. Oh, absolutely. Okay, okay. Please so, do. Uh, so the meatball happens to moonlight as a bartender at the Trop. Okay. The hell is that so, 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 um, yeah. So Wednesday, I go up for the day game. Okay, with a couple of my pals, and uh, I actually uh, get up in the booth. I do a, a half inning with Root Sports and uh, Tim Neverett and uh, John Weiner uh, up in the booth. Um, do a little pregame show with uh, with Tim, uh, the the Pittsburgh guys, and then I go meet my buddy. So we uh, we happen to go out to center field to the porch where the meatball is uh, tending bar, and uh, you know just kind of funny, just kind of sneaking between, and say, hey, give me a beer, you know. Just I, I said a little bit uh, different than that, but uh, you know, it's just uh, you know the meatball sees me, uh, we all laugh. <laughs> my uh, two pals, uh, they get two IPAs. I don't know what an IPA is. I it's a fancy beer or something, but it's a it's only in a what, a 16-ounce uh, glass? Yes. Uh, no, it's a cup, isn't it? It's, it's not even a glass. It's no, a plastic it's a cup. cup. It's a plastic okay, glass. so we got, t we got 32 ounces of IPA. Okay, so 16 and 16 from my two pals. I, uh, I uh, you know, watch my figure. Uh, you know, I get an ultra. Uh, what, what's that, 20 ounces, 16 ounces? 16 ounces. 16 ounces, a can. You don't even offer me a cup. Okay, so anyway. So uh, I don't pay for this, by the way, but my pal does. It came to $33 meatball. Okay, thirty-three bucks. Okay, yeah, you didn't have anything to do with anything other than what? Well, all right, defend yourself. Okay, well, first of all, okay, that's fine. The Good. name nice on the back going. of my jersey is Mo Stansbury. moving right along. Uh, okay, okay. Well, so so anyway, let's go back to uh, the All Star game and um, our uh, gaff by the uh, used car salesman uh, way back when, whenever there was a tie. In oh, Milwaukee, my, uh, right way. Yeah, right yeah, way. yeah, yeah. Um, the the worst thing that could ever happen to baseball a tie in the All Star game. I, you know what? It, it's unfortunate. It's it is what it is. But to determine the 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 team that's going to win the World Series by giving them the advantage of having four home games just because you know this happened, you know it, it's changed and it's altered the finals for the last World Series since that day has happened. Okay, this is the most ridiculous rule that that uh, Selig and, and I, I don't know, maybe it's tied for you know, the top ten of worst things that a commissioner could do. But this right here is the stupidest thing that a commissioner could possibly do is award, okay, award uh, an advantage in the World Series for a bunch of guys that are out there in an exhibition. And, you know, what? The, you know, let's, let's, let, let's uh, you know, let's sugarcoat this. It's an exhibition. Back whenever I played and back when you played, it was an honor to make the all-star team. 
nobody turned it down. The only time you ever turned it down is because you were hurt. I had one year where I was going to you know, qualify to, to get to the All-Star team, and, uh, and uh, Davey Johnson was the manager, and uh, I believe it was 87, I'm not sure. But he took, there was Gary Carter that got voted in New York. He was hitting 220. Hey, Gary Carter, you know what? Everybody wanted to see him. And Craig Biggio, who at the time was catching, he was hitting 300. And he only took two catchers, and I was hitting like 315 at the time, and and they, you know that was my only chance that you know that I was able to get the All-Star, and I was crushed. And now you Darvish uh, has come out and said, "Well, I, I don't believe in the All-Star game. I don't want to be in it." Blah blah blah. And there's a whole bunch of guys that beg off the All-Star game. So you know now you have some of your best players. They don't care about it, except. The fact that they may be in the World Series, and now you might be playing in in a in a place. You know, think about this. Uh, you know, some of the toughest places to play, and now you've got to go there four times. Uh, you know, maybe four times to to beat the other team. Uh, the, to me, it's the most ridiculous rule that again that Bub Selig has ever thought about uh, uh, enacting. Yeah, I you know what, 88 I had the the same exact thing you did. At 88 I was leading the uh, American League in earned run average at the All-Star break and thought for sure I was going to the All-Star game. I had a pretty good record going. And Ozzie Guillen went in and made a bitch with his agents and everything and then Ozzie had to go to the uh, White Sox really weren't full of stars then we weren't in the race. So Ozzie Guillen went in, bitched with his, his agents and everything like that and Ozzie Guillen went to the to the All-Star game, to the fact that I actually have two All-Star cards in the collectible field, and I never went to an All-Star game. This is how late this thing happened. And and, and, and you're right, Spanky, you're crushed. You know, your players are coming, your teammates are going up saying, man, you're having a hell of a year, you deserve to go, congratulations, you know you're going to make it. And then, oh, uh, they just took that air out of the balloon. And, and, it, and it takes you a while to get over it. I'm sure you really didn't start off on fire that second half because – you know, I'm, I'm sure when you went home for the three days, you enjoyed yourself. Oh yeah, I did. You know, but I tell you one thing. I mean, um, the next time we played the Mets, yeah, I wanted to shove it up Davey Johnson's ass. I mean, it, I mean, just that—that's how much it meant to players back then. And now, I mean, I don't know how, what, what do they got? Forty guys on the All Star roster now. You got you got guys that are bench players that are that are playing uh, in the in All Star games. Uh, you got you got guys that that are I mean specialists. You know that that uh, end up making the team, and you know it's not uh, that that's how that's not how you know the whole idea was 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 uh, was made. Let's go back a little bit farther of what you said. You, you said it's a privilege to to play in an All Star game, to be an All Star. It's a privilege to be in the major leagues. It, it, it's a privilege, like like an American general. Remember, it used to be a privilege to own a large house, a nice house, or maybe a, a nice car that you really had to work for it. And put in a lot of years of determination and guts and, and, and sweat and tears and and then you were rewarded, and and now it's you know you look around anybody can have you know just claim section eight you're out in a big house anytime you want to you know same thing with the major leagues, these rookies now that are hitting uh, let's take Bradley of Boston he's been up there the whole year he's hitting two two oh something uh you can find it here a second uh, Jackie Bradley is hitting two oh six. Jackie Bradley Jr., excuse me, I don't, I don't know who Senior is, but whoever the hell he is, Jackie Bradley uh, Jr. is hitting 206, been up the whole time, and there's absolutely no threat of sending him down to the minor leagues. If you came up as a rookie and you hit 206, you weren't there long. Yeah, you, you get you know, 15 days, maybe a month, and then, you know, it's, see you later, we're going to find somebody else. But uh, anyway, uh, let's let's talk about the All-Star game. Well, uh, can I, and I want to say that I, I too, have a, an All-Star experience. When I was 12 in Little League, um, they they took somebody else over me on the All Star team too. So I truly, Holy Christ, I, tro can we just I truly move on to the know, next subject? I truly Holy know shit. what you guys are going through with this All Star. Who stuff let stuff. the meatball out of the pot? Christ, yeah, well, we're, well, we're eight minutes well, away well, from break. Get the hell out of well, here. Well, hold on. You know, you know let, let's go ahead. I, I want to find out who that manager was that left you off the All Star team, and let's get him a shot on at, at uh, coming here and and talking about the meatballs. Hopefully uh, it's his future uh, father-in-law. Is there anywhere close? That, could he have been around there then? No, uh, this is in Indiana, so we'll leave it be at that. But I, I, I just know all-star disappointment. I didn't have it in my contract that I would make a bonus for the all-star team, but I, I too, was, was crushed. Was it okay. as disappointing as the first time they gave you your Little League uniform and it came nowhere as close to fitting? 
Uh, no, it, it fit because I actually didn't get chubby till high school. Oh, so, that's yes. terrible. All right, so uh, we've uh, we talked about the all star thing. Um, I got I got I got a list. Are we ready for my list? Spanky, if you tell me that you want to do something, buddy, I all right. Here we go. Because here we go. Right now, if if, if I'm the all star manager, and I'm only but gonna I am get... gonna say if I disagree or not. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and these are just starters. Okay, that uh, for the team, I've picked out a couple of uh, starting pitchers and a couple relievers, but I've got uh, here in the American League. The American League to me was pretty cut and dry. I thought uh, it was it was fairly easy to pick the guys. I guess Salvador Perez, catcher for Kansas City. I, I've got I've got Miggy Cabrera, uh, first baseman for uh, Detroit. Second base, um, I've got Jose Altuve. Is that how you, uh, how you Altuve, say yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jose Altuve with Houston. I a shortstop. I got Alexei Ramirez. Whoa, 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 whoa. Dude, 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 dude. Yeah. Who's what? retiring this year? So he's he's a, he's a bench guy. No, he's not. He's the starter. Okay. You know Derek Jeter's going to win every vote possible. You, before <laughs> you go any farther, Derek Jeter's a starting shortstop. An okay. easy thing to overlook. Okay. Well, you know what? Um, I I make him the uh, the captain of the team. But you know what? If I'm Derek Jeter, I appreciate you know that that thought that you have, and he certainly deserved. Uh, he's got all of my respect, uh, and and everybody else that knows anything about baseball. But you know what? I make him the captain of the team. I don't put him out there because he knows he doesn't deserve to be the starter. That's just all I have to say about it. And you know what? Hey, we, we'll agree to disagree. But you know, like like I said, he he deserves every accolade that you can possibly come up with. You know, with uh, you know, with this. So you know, so Mo let's moving on to third base. All right, uh, Adrian Beltre uh, with the uh, Texas Rangers uh, outfield was real easy. Michael Brantley with Cleveland, Mike Trout uh, L.A. and Jose Batista with the Blue Jays. And my designated wow. hitter is Victor Martinez, who's having a fabulous year, a year with uh, Detroit. Uh, my two starting pitchers that I picked: uh, Masahiro Tanaka with the Yankees and King Felix. With Seattle relievers, I've got Greg Holland, Kansas City, and Fernando Rodney uh, as uh, my two relievers. Again, the uh, American League it was pretty much cut and dry for, yeah, the, for the my starters. The only difference I had, and I did mine, what, three, four weeks ago, I had uh, Kurt Suzuki as catcher because they are playing in Minnesota. Um, agreed with you with Cabrera, Altuve. I, at the time, I had Josh Donaldson, who was leading the league in home runs and RBIs. Cheater. Um, very interesting, but you left Nelson Cruz off the list. Um, and who is leading the league in home runs and RBIs right now? And I can see that Every, everything else, buddy. We are tighter in two coats of paint. I, 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 you know, maybe that's why we drank together all the years. <laughs> all right, so national. No, no, no. We're oh, gonna, oh, we're no, gonna no, go. Oh, hey. Oh yeah, yeah. We gotta give the yeah, microphone to the meatball again. We gotta again. give it back. Oh, hell, to the I, was, I was gonna get warmed up. You know, this this is why he earns his two and a half beers a week because he got bumped from an All Star game and now he gets to talk about injuries, meatball. Right back at you, brother. Well, I am glad that I can be some sort of amusement for you boys today. As we said, we did have two weeks off, so the injury list is a little bit longer today. So let's start off with the guys that are maybe hurt, banged up a little bit, but haven't gone to the DL. David Wright has a bruised rotator cuff. Doesn't look like the DL's in his future. May miss a few games. Haley Ramirez was out for four games, came back, got a tight calf, left after about four outs. Um, he's always hurt in L.A., so who knows what's going on with him as he's trying to get this big contract out for the Dodgers. Let's take a look at the guys that did end up on that 15-day disabled list or any disabled list that, for that matter. Danny Santana of the Twins has a bone bruise in his left knee. He's going to be out for, for a while. Uh, Chuch, uh, Carlos Ruiz, he's on the seven-day concussion disabled list, so he's going to be out for the Phillies. And Danny Hechevaria, we just started to hit a little bit for the Marlins. He's got a right tricep strain going to be out. Will Nieves, the backup catcher, for the Phillies is also out with a right quad strain, so they're down to two minor league catchers right now. Angel Pagan has a bad back. He's going to be out. Kyle Blanks, the big hitting first baseman for the Oakland A's, is a strained left calf. He's on the disabled list. Josh Reddick, right knee strain. Strained that knee, was out, injured until May, out for a while, came back for a couple of days, and he is out. Andrew Kashner has a sore right shoulder. He's out. Jaime Garcia and Michael Walker both have shoulder injuries. They went on the disabled list of the same day. Who knows about Walker? He has a stress reaction to a bone in his shoulder. Maybe more about rest than injury for this guy. Brett Laurie for the uh, Toronto Blue Jays has a broken right finger. Rafael Fercal hurt his right hamstring. Colton Wong for the Cardinals has another sore shoulder. Nori Aoki 
left groin strain for the Kansas City Royals. Not sure if he's going to come back as the way Jared Dyson has been playing for them. David DeJesus broke a bone in his hand. He's out. Yonder Alonso has been a complete bust in San Diego. Can't get a hit, but he has a sore right wrist. He's made himself to the disabled list. Drew Pomerantz fractured his hand. He's out for the Oakland A's. Bronson Arroyo, funny, first deal trip in 19 seasons. Made over 350 starts and strained his UCL in his elbow. Doesn't look like he's going to need surgery, but it's the first time in his big league career that he is making the disabled list. Eduardo Nunez for the Twins has a hamstring injury. And Bud Norris has that famous groin strain. He made it to the disabled list. Some guys that made it back in the last couple of weeks, Eric Young Jr., Colby Rasmus, Miguel Gonzalez got lit up this week by the Rays. Gio Gonzalez is back for the Washington Nationals, uh, solidifying up their number one lead in the ERA in the race. Zach McAllister, the Cleveland Indians, is back from the DL. Brandon Geyer made it back from the table list after having a broken hand. Cody Ashey, the third baseman for the Phillies, is on the DL, or made it, was on the DL and made it back. Jared Saltalamaki back for the Marlins. Juan Uribe for the Dodgers. Wilson Ramos after a hamstring injury. Back for the Washington Nationals, the greatest name behind the plate, Wellington Castillo. I don't know of I don't know if that's of the Royal Castillos or not, but he is back from the disabled list as the catcher for the Cubs. The great pitcher Garrett Cole off the DL for the Pirates. Michael Saunders, the outfielder for the Mariners. Neil Walker after the appendectomy, he's back for the Pirates. A couple of rehabs and signings. Bryce Harper went on a rehab assignment, could possibly be back tomorrow. The Rangers signed. Carlos Pena to play first base, back where he started. And as we said before, the Pirates have traded Jason Grilly to the Angels for Ernesto Frieri, pretty much a closer-for-closer closer deal, change of scenery deal for those two guys. That's a look at all the transactions and the injuries that we had for the last couple of weeks. Fellas, I'm sure you got more shit to talk on me. Back to you. Like stealing candy from a baby. Welcome back to the Clubhouse Show. Dave LaPointe, Mike Lavalier, the meatball, Chris Stansberry, pushing all the buttons. Fernando. We are at Doc's Grill here at Summerfield Crossings Golf Course, and uh, what a what a just a lovely day. 97 degrees, no humidity. It was, it was hotter than dogs' balls out there today. But we we were interrupted by the uh, by the meatball there, Spanky. We were going over All Star Team. Let's let's go to the National League now. We did pretty good there as, as a team. Uh, getting that American League squad out there. What, what do you got for the National League? Well, I, I, I end up with a, a couple of a uh, couple of positions where you know I still there's some debate. Um, but as uh, as my catcher, I get Jonathan Lacroix. And uh, this uh, <laughs> this past week there was a I guess some uh, little controversy between Milwaukee and the Cardinals. Uh, you know all the fans from Lacroix. They were they they did an anti Molina thing or something. I, they I, they not, made a whole video. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how it was, uh, but I, you know what, Jonathan Lacroix right now is uh, he's just having a, a unbelievable, fabulous year. And to me, you know, he he deserves to be uh, the number one guy. Uh, first base. That's where I had a little bit of an issue. Uh, Matt Adams, absolutely fabulous, uh, but Justin Morneau. In, in Colorado is just having a great year. So right now, you know, let's uh, let's take it down the, the next uh, week or two uh, to see who uh, ends up going ahead. But, you know, I, I like uh, that tandem at Morneau and Adams. I think both of them deserve to make the team. At second base, I get D Gordon. Exciting. Stolen bases. Done a great job for the Dodgers. Uh, your buddy, Toy Lewitsky, uh who is going to be on the trading block uh, in my league. Uh, he's on my team, and since you have get, said... Get rid of him before you see him. Yeah, before he gets there hurt. Us. Get him all right, now. So, so, so all my buddies in the B-Town uh, League, uh, Spankers, Crankers, uh, is looking to make a deal for Troy Tolowitzki. So anyway, he's my shortstop. Third base, pretty much a dark horse here. I don't know if he's on anybody's ballot except mine, Casey McGahee. Uh, with 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 the well uh, deserving, well deserving. Uh, in the outfield, and I looked at this as left field, center field, right field. I got Puig and I got Charlie Blackman in the outfield. Uh, there's really no left fielder to me in the National League. That's that's kind of what about Justin Upton? Yeah, you know what? He strikes out too much, and I had him on my fantasy team, and I don't like the way he plays. Well, but uh, enough said then. You know, hey, hey, I'm the manager. Cut the balls and, and, off of that horse. Yeah, I'll yeah, tell you that yeah, much. Yeah. Get him out of here. Okay, but you know, look at it. Obviously, he got some votes, but I, I denied him. He had a terrible year on my fantasy team. So you know what? Guess what? Take a hike. I just don't. Uh, it's not good enough. I'm going to move one of my right fielders to left field. And who we so, got there? 
No, no, that's Puig and Charlie Blackman. Okay. So one of the two. In, in center field, I got Andrew McCutcheon. In right field, I got Michael Stanton. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce Giancarlo very well, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm going back to Michael Stanton. I thought you used to write that in your underwear. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, they never gave me a pen on my underwear because they were afraid of exactly what I would put on there. <laughs> So the clubhouse guys, they all know. Oop, there it is. <laughs> nah, they uh, just Oops, said no. Keep, keep 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 the sharpie away from Spanky. Uh, um, uh, so 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 my so uh, no designated hitter because it's the National League. Right. Uh, two starting pitchers to me, uh, the two best right now: Johnny Cueto uh-huh. and Adam Wainwright. No uh, complaints. Okay. Uh, my relievers uh, again to me. Uh, Francisco Rodriguez and Trevor Rosenthal have just been head and shoulders yeah. above everybody else. So that's my uh, that's my uh, picks for uh, the starters of the American League and the National League. Uh, the only one that I think uh, worth consideration, uh, Goldie Paul Goldschmidt, with sure, absolutely. You know, but, and, but, and then there, one of those one of those three is your designated hitter. Okay, I got you on that. I I, I got no problem with that. Uh, again, stats wise. Uh, you know, Schmitty, uh, Goldschmidt is uh, you know, going to have the better power numbers. Uh, Morneau, I tell you what, he's got he's got comeback player of the year right now. As you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and Matt Adams just having a great year now, in St. Louis. The Cardinals have been so. out in L.A. the last four days. You think that uh, uh, little Flash Gordon's been over there and uh, hey, Mr. Matheny, uh, how you doing? <laughs> nice talking to you. Uh, uh, yeah, let okay. me see. Uh, uh, maybe so, have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bonus that might come yeah. out of me. Uh, uh, Chase Utley is is a name that came off second base for me, who uh, could be probably going to be comeback player of the year. Um, and I had Justin Upton and left. Uh, I had Carlos Gomez in center. Yeah, um, Carlos got some uh, he gets some votes, but uh, I don't like him. Yeah, I'm the manager. I'm the oh, manager, and I don't want that guy to play for me. I think he's a jackass. Well. You know what? But that's hey, I'm the manager, so I I pick my own team. And that's just the way it is. I don't want to deal with this brat. It's your party. Exactly. We don't call you Spanky for nothing. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. And that, that, hey, listen, that's coming from a big leaguer right there. I mean, that, that's when the shit goes on in the clubhouse. You sit down, all of a sudden the man stands up. He pounds his beard down. He says, listen, I just don't like that asshole. That's and the way it goes. That's a man standing up. You, there's no way you can put that in delicate words in a newspaper. You know, I, I, I straddled the fence once, and I slipped and you know what happened? I got my balls ripped off. And, okay, and at that point, I decided I'm not straddling the fence ever again. What, was it a fence or was it like a, like a head? All right, it was the curb. All right, it was the curb. All right, it was the curb. Just want to make sure we're not getting too tall when we're not looking. Oh, what else are we going to go to right now? Now, you know, over this two-week period, we saw the first front office firing, and it just happened to be a general manager. That is really taking the fall. That guy is as far away from the field as you could possibly be. He is personally not responsible for the San Diego Padres not putting up numbers. Josh Burns is the general manager that was fired. Should he be fired? And since he did get fired, let's talk about the next guys that are going to go. Well, you know what? They, should he be fired? Um, you know what? If management feels they you know, need to make a choice and, and fire somebody, well, you know what? That's management's prerogative. Uh, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, Just like I, you I, got I, taken I, Carlos Gomez. They can decide anything sure, they sure. want um, to. Um, I, I don't think Burns is, uh, I don't think he's thrown any pitches. I don't think he's uh, hit any baseballs. I don't think he's made any errors. Um, what's happened is he's, he's put together what I think is a pretty decent team. But when you look at each and every position, every guy is underperforming from where they've ever done. I mean, it's the, it's the worst thing. It's a worst case scenario that could happen. You've got a full team, what I think has got some talent on it, that is just underperforming. They're terrible right now. And that's now, not that, the general manager. No, that's, that's the manager. Well, you you got to look at the manager there. Right. I mean, you got to you got to look at something there. You, you can't fire all the players. I mean, that that's just but, you know you can't release six or seven guys. You can't you can't send down seven or eight guys. Whatever it is. But so what? Where you got to look for a scapegoat somewhere? Well, good gracious! You know what? It's the guy that's running these guys out there every day. You got to be accountable. And then you know what? The general manager isn't the guy that's accountable for the your 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 players on the field. Your general manager is accountable for 
you know, who they give the man, uh, what kind of tools they give the manager. The that, off, that's the that's off who season it is. is the general manager's in season is the manager. And sure. the funny thing about this is they're thinking the guy most likely to replace Burns as general manager is going to be Bud Black, <laughs> who is the manager of the team. And I love Bud Black, and I played against him. Bud's a great guy. You, you, you don't fire a general manager, not even the halfway point, I, I would say without having a replacement ready to step in and take over that that minute you fire them. The, the the only way I get the only thing I can possibly think of is that there there's something more behind the scenes that has gone on, uh, something that Burns had tried to you know do that just rubbed the ownership the wrong way and and they, you know it doesn't make any sense. It, this firing does not make the San Diego Padres better right now. Well, the funny thing is is that I read an article that said. Uh, well, first of all, Josh Burns is a great baseball guy. He's he's he put together a good team. Jed, whatever, Giorco, Everett Cabrera, these guys are just not hitting. But the funny thing that I read is that they're actually considering Kevin Towers to be his replacement. Now, Kevin Towers still has a job in Arizona, but but he's got Big Brother watching with Tony Larusa now out there, and maybe he's gone and Larusa moves into the GM in Arizona. But they're actually talking about bringing back Kevin Towers as well in San Diego. They they they're kicking this idea around. Which, if you're going to fire Josh Byrne, the last guy that I would bring back is Kevin Towers, so we can give away the whole minor league system for one guy. But Kevin Towers was let go when new when new ownership came in. Uh, you know, he he wasn't doing a bad job. He 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 built them up pretty good. And Kevin Towers is a general manager that that builds a team through his bullpen first, and he's the first guy that really came around a long time to build through the bullpen. If you get a lead. Let's win the game, and and it made sense, and he did a really good job. He tried to do it in Arizona, and he's he's lost a lot of a lot of people. Speaking of a team that's underachieving, although I do think Arizona is still going to come up and finish in third place. They're going to get ahead of the Rockies and the, and the Padres. But do we bring them back? Uh, you're right. Maybe it's hard to go back from a team like that, but seeing now it's new ownership, maybe maybe they liked them before. Maybe. Maybe they would have kept him if they would have bought the team. I, I just think that the whole team in San Diego is underperforming, and, and Burns getting the, the the bullshit rap on the deal. Um, he's not the guy that you know. He put together a good team, or a, a team that at least that you know some of the some of the insiders said, hey, they they might be able to compete for a uh, wild card spot. Josh Burns is not one of those guys that came out of the Boston, the uh, you know the 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 eggshell that they had of all these guys that came out to be general manager. Uh, the Chicago's loaded, you know, and, and, and the guys like that. Now, Boston's going to make a move now. They're going to call up a rookie named Mookie, Mookie Betts. And Mookie Betts is not a home run hitter. He's an on-base percentage machine. Do the Boston Red Sox still have a chance of overtaking the rest of the American League East and getting back in the playoffs? There's baseball left. I mean, as, as you well know, there's a, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of, Games that happen in August and September that you know right now you, you you I've been on teams that have come from far back I've had I've been on teams that had leads that have lost leads that have been close uh, there's a lot of baseball left there's you know over three months of baseball left um, to just go ahead and say no you can't come back I don't believe so um, yeah I believe the Red Sox they do have enough. And they have enough talent. They have enough veteran leadership where they can come back. Uh, this isn't your fire sale, you know, type of uh, scenario where you know, the Red Sox just say, "Hey, you know what? We're gonna just forget about this year and then build for next year." I still think that there's enough there, uh, and there's a number of those teams that are uh, teetering on what are we going to do come trade deadline time? Are we gonna go ahead and retool? Um, I, I know the Red Sox are like that. Uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, uh, they're in that situation right now. Can they come back? I don't believe the Rays can come back. I do believe the Red Sox can, though. Well, you know, a lot of these uh, in, in uh, the meatball talked about some of the guys on rehabs that are coming back. And, you know, in that division alone, now the Yankees got Sabathia coming back. Uh, he threw 37 pitches, said everything was good. So uh, hopefully he's back. Hellickson, Hellickson's had some rough outings. He got blasted there in one start at AAA, but you know sometimes guys like Hellickson are more effective in the big leagues because they've got a great changeup. Uh, the thing that I've seen about Hellickson, which is disturbing to me, is that they haven't they haven't messed with his motion at all, and now his his, his uh, elbow starting to act up again. That's what happens if you don't change the problem; it's going to come back. Masterson coming back with Cleveland, Holland's coming back with Texas. Um, these might be the free agents, you know. And in Boston, bringing up Mookie Betts. 
But uh, Buckholz is also ready to come back, and that's the guy. If he comes back, then I think they have a chance of getting back in it. All right, uh, this is the Clubhouse Show. I am Dave LaPointe with, here with uh, Mike Lavalier and the Meatball. We're going to take a little break and uh, turn it over to the Meatball right now, and he is going to talk about his fantasy picks for the week. Meatball, here you go, babe. All right, guys, let's take a look. We did have two weeks ago, so I will go back to the stats from two weeks uh, for when I made these predictions. My guys, I took Michael Waka as my pitcher. Waka only got one start two weeks ago as he was solid. He got a win versus the Mets. He went six innings and only allowed one run on five hits, striking out seven and only walking two. He was eventually giving his scheduled start off on Sunday for some rest and to bank some innings for the later in the season. He ended up on the disabled list. He had a stress reaction to a bone on his shoulder. Like I said before, not quite sure how serious this is going to be. There's no timetable, whether this is a just a, a BS move by the Cardinals to give him a little bit of rest off for September and October, or if he actually has a serious problem in his shoulder. My hitter, I got a little bit of flack uh, for going out on a limb and taking Andrew McCutcheon for the week, uh, June 16th to the 22nd. Cutch, he wasn't as good as we'd hoped. He was only 4 for 24. He had two RBIs and a run scored that week. He has since gone on to have an eight-game hitting streak this past week with a homer and some RBIs. So I was a one week early on Andrew McCutcheon, but um, he still did perform a little bit. So if you had him, hopefully you kept him for an extra week. This week's guys, I'm going to take Steven Strasburg as my pitcher. He's starting to be himself again, and he gets a couple really, really favorable matchups this week. He first on Tuesday, he's going to face the Colorado Rockies. Overall, they they do have the best offense in the NL, and I'm not doubting that. But they are 21st in runs scored and in the top 10 in strikeouts when they are playing away from Coors Field, and this game is going to be in D.C. On Sunday, he gets to face the last place Cubs. The Cubs are fourth in MLB in strikeouts and 28th in runs scored. Should be a great week for the Nats starter. Look for him to rack up a ton of strikeouts and a ton of innings pitch for you on your fantasy teams. My hitter of the week, I'm going to go with Freddie Freeman of the Atlanta Braves. Freeman faces the Mets and the Diamondbacks this week, two teams which he has hit very well in his career. Versus the Mets, he is a career 333 hitter, and he has a 617 slugging percentage. He has eight home runs, 25 RBIs, and 10 doubles versus the Mets all time. Versus Arizona, he's just as good. He has a six, uh, 360 hitter, has a 680 slugging percentage with five homers, 11 RBIs, and nine doubles. Plus, Freeman is 360 in his last seven games. He's he's really hot right now. He's leading this first-place offense in Atlanta, scoring some runs. As far as my team goes this week, I'm going to take Steven Strasburg. At catcher, I'm going to take Spanky's guy. I'm going to take Sal Perez. Guy is still on. Last week, he had 381 and a homer with a couple of RBIs and some run score. He has some favorable matchups this week. He has to play in division against Minnesota and Cleveland. First base, like I said, is Freddie Freeman. At second, I'm going to go with Ian Kensler. He is hot as the Tigers are right now. He went 14 for 27 this week, 519, two homers, eight RBIs, seven runs, and even a stolen base. He's setting the table, leading off for this hot Tiger offense. At third base, there were several choices. Adrian Beltre hit, hit a ton this week, but I'm going to go with Kyle Seager. He's making the most of hitting behind Robinson Cano. He had 522, two homers, eight RBIs, five runs scored. A lot of third basemen were hot this week, but Kyle Seager is my guy. At shortstop, Johnny Peralta is on an eight-game hitting streak, and last week hit 350. Homer eight runs batted in. He's leading all shortstops in defensive runs saved as the Cardinals, who went from being almost last place last year to defensive runs saved, short up their defense a little bit, apparently, on the offseason, which we didn't think they did, and they are now in first place in all of baseball. In the outfield, I'm going with Dave's boy, Justin Upton. He had 357 as a Braves offense, has been jump-started. They just have to watch the strikeouts. Upton added two homers, nine RBIs, and four runs scored this past week. Other outfielder, I go J.D. Martinez. He was AL Player of the Week last week, and this week he continued his hot hitting. He had two homers, seven RBIs, four runs scored. It doesn't even hurt that he gets to hit behind two MVP candidates in Miguel Cabrera and Victor Martinez. Finally, in the outfield, I'm going with Billy Hamilton. He's making more than just speed his game. He had 357 this week in the leadoff spot. Four RBIs, three steals, and four runs. He's actually even belted four home runs this season. Anytime he gets on base, you might as well pencil him in at second. As always, you can follow me at Mr. Meatball Says for your fantasy updates at Dave LaPointe at Spanky Catches and most importantly at My Clubhouse Show. Send us your Twitter. We want to hear from you. I'm sure Spanky and Dave will have an opinion on it. Guys, back to you. Welcome back, everybody. You know what? Uh, I didn't hear the name Jack Doney mentioned at all in your fantasy picks. I don't know who that is. That's my little guy right there. Jack Doney just got back when the uh, 12 U All-Stars from Cooperstown. He was almost like MVP up there. How could you leave him off? Um, well, they didn't put him on who's hot on Yahoo. So, unfortunately, you need to make a phone call to Yahoo because apparently you are hotter than anybody else. What position do you play? Second base. Second base. Well, 
you know what? I don't think we have room for whoever's on my second base. Who did I take on second base? I took Ian Kinsler. Forget it. You're in. Think about it. Kinsler, Cano, Doney. Easy choice. It rolls right off the mouth. All right. Let's let, let's get back. Uh, you know what? In uh, one of these free agents that might be coming back, uh, and, and I'm talking to Mike Lavalier, one of the, the greatest co-hosts anybody can have, We're sitting next to the meatball. There's not a piece of food or a beverage that slips by that part of the table. But David Price. Now, we mentioned a couple weeks ago, I think it's a done deal. I think he's going to St. Louis. Do they need him? Will they take him? I mean, personally, right now, the Cardinals, are just they have just about played themselves out of the race because of the people that they are losing through the injury bug that, that you know, they, unless, you know, Waka is DL but not really hurt. They did the th same thing with Shelby Biller, Miller last year. Do they need Price or are they going to get Price? Well, I tell you one thing. What, what's gone on is, you know, in, in a perfect world, yeah, David Price is out there. Um, he's a guy that, to me, the premier guy that is, let's say, trade bait. And uh, David Price is, uh, you know, obviously upset about it. He's, uh, you know, uh, taking it upon himself to go public with the with the boohoo. And uh, you know, you know what? You've been traded. I've been traded. Did we have to call the ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, He's and, and, a little bit. Well, you know what? And and and. <laughs> I, I get traded from the Cardinals to the Pirates, and it was it was, it was a time whenever the Cardinals were you know just a, you know fabulous. Uh, it, it's a great city. Uh, Pittsburgh at the time had lost uh, 100 games four seasons in a row. Uh, things were going sideways, if not downward spiral. Um, but I didn't know that Jim Leland was there and they were building. But uh, whenever I get traded from the uh, Cardinals to the Pirates, obviously I was upset. You know, it's a very upsetting thing to, to go from a fabulous organization to an organization that was, uh, let's say, shrouded in, in misery. And, um, uh, you know, but that's that's part of the game. But, uh, yeah, David Price out there, uh, you know, hey, I don't want to leave. Well, you know what, that's great. You know, you don't want to leave, but, you know, it's part of the game. Until you get 10 years in, you know, and, you, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, you just don't have a choice. You, you, you know, it is what it is. And um, I would have loved to have uh, spent one uh, or my whole career in one in one place. You know, that's 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 great. That's fabulous. But that's just not the way. Not many guys know, do that. No, it just uh, the dynamics of, of of the game and and the free agency and and everything. That's just not the way it is. And and. Uh, you know, it just uh, you know to have price you know go public on it. Well, you know, now can St. Louis afford them? Yeah, I think they can afford them. Okay, but uh, well, I think what happens is now everybody's looking for this guy. Can we afford him as a free agent? And to me, that's not the way you look at this. You look at this guy as a as a hired arm. Okay, a, 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 a you know a, a gunslinger that you're going to have for part of this year. You know, from July all the way to the end of the year, and at the end of that year, you still have his rights. Okay, so now what do you do? You put him on the trading block, and now what a chip that is. Or if he does very, very well, you sign him to a long-term contract. Well, again, you've got that choice, but what now? What ends up happening is now you have some of these smaller market clubs that can go out there and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and trade David Price, you know, trade for him, and I'm going to give up some prospects. But you know, what, come December, come the winter meetings. I'm going to go ahead and put him back on the block, and I'm going to be up front with him. Hey, David, this is baseball business. Okay, you might not like it, but that's just the way it is. And, and you know, there's a lot of folks out there that don't like it, and I didn't like it, but that's just the way it is, and that's the way you got to live with. And, and, you know, as a player, yes, you are a commodity, and, yes, you are a, a, a piece of meat that gets traded or released, at, you know, at, at a whim. Uh, but you know that's just uh, you know something you have to deal with. I, I looked at it with common sense. I got you know I was traded a few times and free agent a few times, all that other stuff, released a few times. As long as it was in the big leagues, <laughs> I didn't give a shit. If I was still going to make big league money and I was going to get big league time of service, I didn't care. Yeah, and yeah. I hated it. You know, I went from St. Louis to San Francisco. I went from I went from heaven to hell in a hurry because you know I was back at Candlestick and, and the Giants were in a really good team. As a matter of fact. In 1985, we were the only team in the history of the San Francisco Giants to lose 100 games. You know that, that that wasn't a fun thing to go through. I went from I went from heaven to hell, 
But I was in the big leagues, and and as we said earlier, it was it's a privilege to be in the big leagues. As long as I was in the big leagues, I didn't care. Well, and again, it's a you know a matter of uh, you know really, you know it's it, it, it's reality. It's just the way it is. And as a player, you know you don't have to like it, but you know what? Uh, you, when you get traded, you always have to remember that somebody wants you. Hey, it may Dave, not be the one you want to be wanted by, but somebody wants you. Hey, David and Price, imagine how good you can be when you're pitching in front of 50,000 every night. Yeah. 45,000. No, no more 50,000 see stadiums. Yeah, 45,000 yeah. people love you and want to cheer you on and appreciate what you've done. Imagine when that happens to you. Imagine yeah. how good he can be when that gets behind him. Well, and, and that's something that, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, around the area, you look at David Price as, as a veteran guy. Uh, how old is he, Meatball? He went on. He was first overall pick in 2007, so right out of college. See, I think he was a junior in college. So we're not 29. He's probably, so he's 29, probably 29, 30. 29, yeah. 29, 30. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say this is still a relatively young man. You know, I mean, and that's the thing. It's just, uh, you know, a lot of. And us I don't think, think that, Astro he, cares. <laughs> Astro will go any place. He can take a dump anywhere he needs to take a dump. Absolutely. Exactly. St. Louis is a wonderful. I, I think there's only a couple teams he can go to. I think St. Louis and Atlanta are the only two teams. That, he won't go to the Yankees because he's not going to shave. Uh, the Dodgers <laughs> don't need anybody. He went to Vanderbilt, which isn't too far away from Atlanta, so that one might be might be a good choice for him right there. I, I also think the Red Sox. I, I really think, yes, it's. In, I, I think in he the wants division. to get out of the American League East. Well, you know what? I, if I was a pitcher, I'd want to get out of the American League East too. And I don't think you know, Tampa's going to do it. I but, don't but, think Tampa would send him. But but, but again. You know, let's. Uh, yeah, that's there's that interleague league. trade thing. That why why would Tampa send him there even even for a short part? Oh of yeah, the interdivision. Believe me, if the Baltimore price really is right, wants him too. If the price is right, okay, for the price for price. Who are they okay. going to give up? Daniel Bard? <laughs> I don't think they have him anymore, do they? Come on, give me give me a rundown on Daniel Bard. This guy was the hundred mile an hour ace closer of the Boston Red Sox a short two years ago. How we have fallen from grace. Yeah, they had two thirds of an inning. 13 earned runs, 9 walks, 7 Now, this is two-thirds of an inning. Two-thirds of an inning. Uh, and this is in four appearances. So there was some times where he didn't record an out. How many walks? Uh, uh, nine, and he hit seven guys. So there's 16 guys that got free passes in two-thirds of an inning. Um, <laughs> 13 earned runs. He, he did strike out one guy, though. Probably out of scared to death here. I'm going to take three swings, get out of here before I get hit. Would, would it possibly be... Can we consider that he's looking like a very young Nuklelouche? <laughs> I, I, I don't know who Nuklelouche is, uh, so you got to help the me Durham out with that. Durham Bulls. You never saw oh, Bull oh, Durham? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't pay attention to the name. I was too busy looking at the checks. Uh, so anyway. Didn't, uh, he, uh, didn't he throw the pitch that took off the head of the, uh, the, the metal mascot that was standing in the batter's box? Yeah, yes, that, he did. <laughs> you know what, Meatball? I would like to see you get against Nuclelouch. That would be funny to me. No. I don't care who you are. That, that, that's some good stuff right there. All right. Well, All right. we're not uh, we're not going to have Daniel Bard, but who who else? Who's out there now? Who's that guy that's possible trade bait that we want to take and and, and, and and put on a new team? Well, uh, I've got a, a few guys out here that, to me, uh, may be obtainable. And by who I don't, I'm not sure. I, you know, I'm not the guy that's writing checks. I don't. I'm not the guy that is out there. You know, wondering about how much eligibility you have. But uh, to me, if I'm uh, going ahead and I'm uh, looking at improving my team, uh, Tampa Bay, I get Ben Zobrist, and you know, Ben's a good player, and uh, you know, obviously very versatile. Uh, if if Tampa Bay is looking to uh, move somebody, I, I believe he, he may be a free agent uh, next year or the year after. Um, ben Zobris might be a guy that could that could bring in some players and a very valuable guy to a team that's in contention. He plays second, plays short, plays the outfield. I mean, this this but, guy but, is a but very I mean, big in the Tampa Bay community of what oh, he sure. does along school stuff. You know, hey, Ben hey, Ben is not having the statistical year that we're used to. He's you know of all the starting second basemen. He's fourth from the bottom, you know. So that that might be a reason they can unload him, and you know, who knows what they have in the minor leagues? To obviously nothing, or else they would have already brought somebody up. Sure, sure. Uh, with the Red Sox, I guess Shane Victorino. 
Uh, Shane is having trouble staying healthy, but here's a guy that uh, you know has got some tools. And if he ever gets healthy, gets in a you know good situation, uh, the Red Sox are intent on uh, playing who they have out there, uh, Jackie Bradley Jr. and uh, you know the the flying Hawaiian. Uh, I could see going to some uh, contender, and, and and not a not a very uh, big price. Are right, you're gonna you you're know. gonna be the pro in this? I'm gonna be the con. Okay. If they bring up Mookie Betts. And get the flying Hawaiian back. Now they have a solid outfield along with Buckholz coming back. They can make a run. Um, the Hawaiian's uh, in the playoffs uh, every year. No oh matter yeah. where he goes, he's in the playoffs. Uh, again, uh, this is when's the trading deadline? One month from tomorrow. August first, isn't it? July thirty first. Yeah, July thirty first. And you know they um, they said in their uh, their release today that they're going to start playing Brock Holt at shortstop. At short. Yeah. Wow. Xander Bogarts has not hit, I think, since they signed Stephen Drew and they moved him to third base. Stephen Drew's on, hitting 100. He, Stephen Drew's hitting 100, and Brock Holt's hitting about a buck 10. So it's not going. And with Victorino, I know that he did have a setback, and they said him and this week, he and Middlebrooks both had a setback, and there is no timetable for their return. So these guys may not even be healthy enough to be sent out for anybody at the trade deadline. Brock Holt's leading all rookies in uh, batting average. Yeah, no, he's uh, been a great surprise for them. Um for Cubs, uh, you know what, Jeff Schmarja. Uh He's been talked about with everybody. Uh, you get him fairly cheap. Uh, you know, you're going to have to give up some big prospects. Here's a guy that's the number one pitcher on that staff, but you put him on a, a, a veteran-type staff, and he's uh, your solid three or four guy. Uh, get him out of Wrigley Field. Wrigley Field in the summertime. Uh, tell us about pl- pitching in Wrigley Field in the summertime with the wind blowing out. How good do you have to be? Well, the thing that bothers me about Samarja is that if you're a winning pitcher, you can win games no matter where you are. And I haven't seen that out of him yet. And I, I think they said today that uh, they are something like three and fourteen in games that Samarja started. That's not the guy that's going to, you know. You want this guy pitching a playoff situation where you know it's going to be a one-run game, two to one, one to nothing. Is that the guy that you're going to trade for and you want to depend on? Well, again, I'll agree to disagree with that. You know what? Get him in a different culture. Get him in a different uh, scenery. Uh, get him with somebody that's thinking a little bit different. I don't know if it's so much mechanics. I don't know if it's so much of of getting him in a situation where he's going to be able to use his physical tools. Because I, I mean, the guy's got a great arm. Now, what? Oh, absolutely. What, what, yeah, you and know, tough as nails. You know, but let's let's go ahead and and get him with a uh, let's say Yadi Molina. And then again, that's just a you know you get him with a veteran catcher, you get him with a different kind of pitching coach. Now you're getting a little more out of this guy. Uh, now he does become a winner. Uh, Mike uh, or Greg Maddox, he used to get his brains beat in whenever he was with the Cubs, and all of a sudden you know now he becomes free agent, goes with Atlanta, and now he's in the Hall of Fame. I so like- I mean, and, and I'm not saying that's going to happen with Smarja. It's so difficult. To pitch for the Cubs in the summertime with that wind blowing out at Wrigley, I mean, it's got to wear on you. Um, as a catcher, you know, you, you're trying to call a game, and you know, ball off the end of the bat. Now it's in the basket, and you know, and now it's a three-run homer. Where anywhere else, uh, even a lot of little league parks, it's going to be a fly out to the outfield. And the good thing about Samarja, if you really want to look at it, is this guy played college football, so that arm doesn't have the wear and tear on it that maybe a normal arm would do. But if I'm a GM and I'm looking at the Cubs, I'm looking at Jason Hamill. This guy has been really, really solid for the Cubs. Uh, I think he came up with Tampa Bay, was with, with Colorado, with the Orioles, then with several teams. This guy is having one hell of a season, too, out there and could be had for probably half the price that Samarja could be had and is, is going to be one of those guys. Kind of reminds me of like a Bud Norris where you're going to get him. He's going to be your three or four but you're going to get him for a good value, and he's cheap, and could be another guy that if you're looking for one guy in the rotation, he he might be the guy. Well, I think, hey, I think hold Hamels, on, hold on Hamels, one second. Oh, learn how to pitch. Too. Yeah, okay. Oh, hold on one second. Hey, Nando, could you get this on tape here? Hey, Meatball, uh, I'm agreeing with you. Oh, that, no, 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 no. Hey, you know what? I'm going to kick him in the ass, but you know what? I'm going to pat him on the back whenever he's right. I, that's a, that's, a, yeah, good, well, yeah, that's but, a good call by the Meatball. But if, if you go back and talk, think about what he just said, he said that Samarja probably didn't pitch a lot because he was a football player. Now, I'm guessing football season and baseball season are not played at the same time of year at Notre Dame. 
and that he probably did play baseball, or else they wouldn't have known he was a baseball player. Yes, I didn't. But what I'm just saying is, I know that he doesn't have the you, innings you in can, his arm. You can redeem yourself right now. Where's he from? Jeff Samarja. Uh, Come on, he played in Notre Dame. Where's he from? Is he from South Bend or Chicago? I don't know. Oh, I, I don't, I don't know. But that's, uh, that's why you're the meatball. You're supposed I, to have this stuff. He's from Samarjaville. Oh. Okay, so move, move, moving, moving on. Moving forward, okay. your, your next guy, uh, I, trade I, bait. I, I, I've got the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, well on the radar here. Um, they're they're down. Uh, they're uh, uh, a ways out of first place. They've got to climb over a couple of teams to even make it uh, into the wild card. But, you know, I'm looking at some guys that, uh, you know, frankly, they're not going to sign next year. I get Russell Martin. Uh, you know, if, if the Pirates are packing it in, Russell Martin, you know, makes a veteran guy that's been through the playoffs. Uh, you know, he's uh, been in World Series. I, I think he's a guy that you move. Uh, I think Neil Walker is a guy that you can move. You know, again, a veteran guy, uh, second baseman. Now, he would uh, cry. Well, yeah. That would be tears. Well, yeah, well, you know what? Neil's from Pittsburgh. He will not like that uh, at all. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, but again, I'm looking at this uh, from a, uh, business standpoint. Um, I think uh, Liriano, he's uh, struggled. Uh, he hasn't had the type of year. But a, a, again, here's a guy that uh, had a fabulous year last year. Uh, he could be a guy that could uh, could be moved. They're not going to sign him again. And, um, you know, right now, um, I think those three guys were They sure. have to have a couple outfielders that are not really comfortable right now. <laughs> Well, they already saw, they they already sent down Jose Tabata. Uh, you know, Tabata's he, he's going to be released. So Snyder's uh, the extra Snyder, guy. Snyder, Snyder's the extra guy. He's going to be released. I mean, you look at it. You got you got three guys. You got Marte, McCutcheon, and Polanco are now in the outfield, and those guys are going to be those three as long as they stay healthy. They're going to be there for a while. All right, you want pro? I'm going to go con. I don't think the I don't think the Pirates are getting rid of anybody because right now they're a game and a half out of the wild card. Okay, so, uh, again, I, I, trade I, I, Neil Walker. Uh, they would go through some public relations hell if that ever happened. Yeah, they would, but you know what? They're going to make themselves better. Uh, Josh how old is How old is Neil Walker? I mean, he can't yeah. be that old. Yeah, he's uh, he's old enough. I mean, not yeah, put, put, it, put, it, put it this way. His first big league spring training, okay, I was there. I, I was playing. Yeah. Well, you know what? In my mind, Neil, no, I wasn't. Neil Walker <laughs> is is one is a future manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, in that very way, and I like Neil, and 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 uh, it would be a PR absolute disaster. You're absolutely right. But again, you know, you're looking at this where you know Josh Harrison is now in the starting lineup almost all the time. Why the meatball gets the big bucks? You just pointed out Neil Walker's 28, soon to turn 29. It's too 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 early to get rid of him. Okay. I, I, again, I agree to disagree. Um, I've got uh, Arizona Bronson Royal, a guy that uh, could uh, you know help somebody uh, be a you know a number five starter, somebody that uh, you know a guy that's got a lot of veteran leadership. And then I've got one of these three to me is going to go. Ethier, Kemp, or Crawford. Uh, I don't know who's going to be able to afford them, but they've got a pretty full field. They've and got, and, they, they, and they, their they, top prospect is an outfielder. You know, they, they get Puig. They get uh, Scotty Van Slyke. Uh, they've got five guys that, you know, that are, you know, can play the outfield. I think, and, I think and, Van, uh, Van Slyke would get the most interest from any team out there. And, and again, but, you know, when you're looking at this, uh, Andre Ethier right now, to me, has... Yeah, I don't know if he's worn out his welcome or, you know, it's time to move on. But, you know, here's a guy that's, uh, you know, been a guy that, that uh, was, you know, vying for, you know, batting titles. And now, you know, he's, he's a uh, platoon uh, player that, you know, isn't even starting against some right-handed uh, pitchers. So, uh, you know, you look at that, uh, well, yeah, what do the Dodgers need? I mean, they've got, it uh, looks like, you know, pretty much a little bit of everything, but hey, to me, you never have enough pitching. You know, what's funny about the Dodgers, and and it was it was kind of what you think about the Dodgers today. They playing against the Cardinals, and they they won easily, and they had a uh, they were showing that uh, Beckett was given a hot foot to Van Slyke. He had the old uh, matches rolled up around a cigarette and a wad of gum, like we you know we got trained the first year, and they were all in on it. And and basically, you could see the whole team of the team guys, the guys that everybody was laughing at it, including Mattingly walking by to get a drink, 
And then there was not the team guys that were worried about their own fingernails and, and what was going to go on with them and how they looked. And, and, and you could just see that if I'm that general manager, Ethier and Kemp are going to go someplace. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get. I'm going to get money right now. Like I said, we talked about the last time on the show. I'm going to send Kemp to Seattle. I'm going to send Jimmy Rollins to Seattle, and maybe give Seattle a chance. All right. But those are the types of guys you're not going to have down a, down a pen of stretch and win with them, and get rid of them right now while you got a chance. Well, anyway, that's that's uh, what I see as uh, you know trade bait. And uh, you know, I'm sure there's uh, deals to be made out there. Um, you know, I, again, I'm not privy to everybody's contract situation. And nowadays, that's a huge part of this. And, and you know, eligibility. And you know, when they're going to become a free agent? How many years do they have on their contracts? I mean, those are all things that, uh, I, again, you know, I'm Here, not a general manager. Here's the last but, thing I want you to look at now. Okay. When Tulo gets hurt in the home run derby contest. They fall apart. They're going to unload some pretty good players out of Colorado. Well, a, a, again, um, if anybody's listening, uh, yeah, Tulo is now up on the trading block uh, oh, in our spanky, in our fantasy league. Spankers, spankers, crankers, spankers, crankers. Did they used to be the wankers? Or have they always been no, the crankers? No, the crankers. Uh, although we were playing like wankers this week, uh, currently in first place. Uh, of course, that was going into tonight, but I'm sure that's going to change. I'll be still in the top four, but. Uh, yeah, just uh, my guys had a little trouble this week. Um, my t team earned run average is somewhere around six. <laughs> Maybe you should start taking the meatballs advice on some of these things. Uh, fantasy. No, don't do it. Don't no, do it. I ain't going to do that. Speaking you know, of the meatball, we are the Clubhouse Show. We are live from Doc's Grill here at the Summerfield Crossings Golf Course. We're going to take a little break right now. We're going to send it over to the meatball, and he's going to talk about the upcoming schedule and possibly – Mid-season awards, the, the meatball. Take it away. All right, let's start in the American League on Monday. The last place Rays head to the Bronx to face the Yankees. Texas is in Baltimore. A first place battle as Oakland is in Detroit. The Angels are on the south side to take on the White Sox. Kansas City's at Minnesota, and Seattle is in Houston. In the National League, Colorado's in the capital to face the Nationals. The Mets are in Atlanta. The Reds are in San Diego. And in interleague play, the Cubs travel to Fenway to face the Red Sox, and Cleveland is at the Dodgers. <clears throat> on Tuesday, everyone else joins in on the fun in the National League. Arizona heads to Pittsburgh. The Phillies are at the Marlins. The Cardinals are in San Fran. And in interleague, we had a surprise first-place matchup as the Red Hot Brewers are in Toronto to face the Blue Jays. At the end of the week, on July 4th, we get some fireworks, and we get it in the AL. We get the Orioles. They're in Boston. The Yankees travel in Minnesota. Another first-place matchup as Toronto heads west to face the Oakland A's. Tampa Bay is at Detroit. Kansas City is in Cleveland. Seattle heads to the White Sox. And Houston is at the Angels. And in the National League, the Cubs are in D.C. Philly battles the Pirates at PNC. The Giants are in San Diego. Milwaukee heads to Cincinnati. The Marlins are in St. Louis. And Arizona is at the Braves. And the Dodgers are at Coors Field. And in interleague play, the Rangers head to City Field to take on the Mets. As Dave said, I kind of put together a little list of my midseason awards, and maybe we'll get a little bit of comments when we get back. But I'm going to go over my awards as the meatball sees them here at the midway point of the season. In the American League, my manager of the year, in first place I have John Gibbons of the Toronto Blue Jays. He's led the team's surprise first place visit. In second, I have Bob Melvin of Oakland. And in third, I have Lloyd McClendon in Seattle, who is the Mariners team now actually in position to have the second wild card position. Rookie of the year in first place, I have Masahiro Tanaka in the New York Yankees. He's 11-3, 127 strikeouts, 2.10 ERA. In second place, Jose Abreu of the Chicago White Sox, 25 homers, 63 RBIs, and batting a pretty decent 280. In third place, couldn't find too many, but I went with James Jones. He has 275 average for Seattle, and he has 14 stolen bases. For my Cy Young, I shook it up a little bit in first place. After today, I have to go with Felix Hernandez. He's 10 and 2, 2.24 ERA. I think that's down to 2.10 now, actually, as we speak. 128 Ks, 120 point, and a third innings pitched. Masahiro Tanaka second for the Cy Young, 11 and 3, 2.10 ERA, 127 Ks, and 115 and two thirds innings pitched. Mark Burley in third. He's 10 and 5, 2.52 ERA, 62 Ks, and 107 and a third innings. For my MVP race, it was a close vote, but I'm going to actually go with Mike Trout of the Anaheim, uh, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. 312 average, 18 homers, 59 RBIs, 10 steals, 53 runs, and he's got a 611 slugging percentage 
Second place, I'll go Miguel Cabrera, 315, 13 homers, 64 RBIs, 46 runs at a 540 slugging. And third place, Victor Martinez, 323, 20 homers, 52 RBIs, 42 runs at a 592. In the National League, my manager of the year, pretty easy choice. I'm going to go with Ron Renneke of the Milwaukee Brewers. In second place, a surprise, Mike Redmond of the Miami Marlins. And in third, Bruce Bochy of the Giants, at taking a team to first place, even though they are struggling as of right now. Rookie of the year, in first place, I go Billy Hamilton. He's got 282 average, four homers, 27 RBIs, 34 stolen bases, and 40 runs scored. Chris Owings of Arizona is second. He's got 277 average, six homers, 21 RBIs. And in third place, the guy that may actually end up winning it, kind of like Will Myers did last year, I want to go Gregory Polanco of Pittsburgh as of right now. He's in third with limited stats, but I think that maybe by the end of the year he may actually win the award. Cy Young Award, I'm going to go Johnny Cueto first. He's got a 188 ERA for the Reds. He's 8-5, 122 Ks, 124 and a third innings pitched. Adam Wainwright of the Cardinals second, 10-4, 201 ERA, 105 Ks, 116 and a third innings pitch, and in third place, Zach Grinke, 10-4, 2.78 ERA, 111 Ks, and 103 and two-thirds innings pitch. My National League MVP in first place, I'm going to go with Jonathan Lucroy, the catcher for the Milwaukee Brewers. He got a 336 average, eight homers, 42 RBIs, ton of hits, 618 slugging percentage. He's on base 400 or 405. He is just dominating the, the position and should be your National League MVP at the break. Second place, I got Giancarlo Stanton. 316, 21, and 60, 596 slugging, and a 410 on base. He's got 97 hits, a couple behind Lucroy. And in third, our whipping boy of the day, Troy Tulowitzki, 348 average. He's got 18 homers, 46 RBIs, 442 on base, and a 618 slugging with 61 runs scored. Maybe in first place if the team was even remotely decent, but they are not. So those are my picks. If you guys got one, one uh, have any conversation about that, that's cool. Um, if not, we'll move on. Dave Spanky. Back to you guys. We are back with the Clubhouse Show coming to you live from Doc's Grill here at the Summerfield Crossing Golf Course. And uh, I think Tula Whiskey has played in like 78 games this year and has been taken out of 51 of them. Shh. Oh, I'm, Shh. I'm, oh. Here, speaking of trading. You hear that? Smackers, I'm Sprinkers knocking on wood as, as, as hard as I can. You're, i, I got to get him traded before he gets hurt. You're trying, you're trying to get something out of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Shh. Don't listen to him. Don't listen. That pointer's he's lying to you, folks. I mean, and, and and not only is he running on one leg, and, and here's a comment. Here's here's one of those things that used to annoy me as a player, and I didn't even know I was going to be a manager back when. You got a guy running from first to third, and that guy, as soon as he hits second base, he's looking back over his shoulder to the to the base hit that went to right field. Don't don't look forward. Look at the coach and, and let him help you out. Look over your back shoulder and see what's going on. Don't trust the coach, and maybe that's why he gets hurt. He's he's running uncomfortably. No comment. All right, I got to get off of that. Well, I mean, you know what? That that's one of those fundamentals of the game that we were all taught a long time ago, and it, and it seems to not matter. Uh, another one of those fundamentals of the game that there there's a big argument about. It doesn't matter what type of an out you make. A strikeout is it, it doesn't matter. If you hit home runs, it's okay if you strike out when you make an out. And I am I'm disgusted with this rule, and especially nowadays with the players that we have up there an alarming amount of errors being made by the players. It doesn't matter which position. If you put the ball in play, you have a chance of getting on base, don't you? You know, there's uh, there's something to be said about making contact. You, you, you have a chance. If you make contact, uh, if you don't make contact, you have no chance. None. That old theory, okay. you can't steal first. I, I got you. You know what? Um, you get up to the plate. You're going to get upset. Right? Right? Aren't you? No, 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 no. I've already. And I I'm still like upset. I, I think you're I'm sexy when you're okay, upset. Okay. Okay. Now, now listen. Okay. You went up to the plate, didn't you? Yes. Were, were you a good hitter? No. Did you get any hits? Yes. Yeah. How'd you How'd you do that? Uh, by swinging. By making contact. Absolutely. Did you hit everything on the on the sweet spot? Absolutely not. You get some off the end of the bat. Yes. Yeah. 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 Me too. Okay. I got most of my hits. Okay. It was designed. Hit it off the label. Or hit off the end of the bat. That way, I was strong enough to get it over the infield and in front of the outfield. Okay, and when I hit the ball on the button, okay, someone caught it. Okay, if you swing and miss, you got zero chance of getting a hit. Okay, if you take strike three, you have zero chance of getting a hit. Put the ball in play, fellas. I mean, it's embarrassing. It is totally embarrassing striking out. I mean, that's the way I, I was. You know, I, the, I the pitcher 20, beat me. 26 hits yeah. in the big leagues, none anticipated. <laughs> um, 
but after you know, you train after a while, you you try to put the ball in play. Put it in play. You never know what's going to happen. How many times have we seen you get professional guys out there, one hopper to the mound, you know it throw you get you know throws it over the first baseman's head. That happens. There's some pitchers out there that aren't very good at that. Okay, just throw into first base on that play. If you do that, there is a chance you're going to get on base. Oh, but you know what? It's not going to be a hit. And now I'm not going to be able to take that to arbitration. And you know what? Guess what? Put the ball in play, you jack wagons. You sound like David Ortiz there arguing with the scorekeeper. Did you just yeah. drop a jack wagon? Jack wagon. I love it. Yeah, jack wagon. You know, and, and you look at Abreu that came over this that's uh, with the White Sox and 25 home runs. I, I think it's his is 17 walks. 71 strikeouts, something like that. They're being told, Spanky, that it's okay. If you strike out, I don't care. You try and hit the three. Earl Weaver would be so happy nowadays. I tell you who would be happy. Me, if I could pitch right now. <laughs> because if all nine guys are going up trying to hit a home run every time, I would have six Cy Youngs. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. It's a change-up that... pitcher will just kill these people. If they're all they're going to do, if they're not going to adjust their strength, their swing, they're tr going to try to hit home runs. I will kill them. And you know, as a catcher, if you put me up against them, I'll I'll throw 96 changeups a game and come out smelling like roses. Yeah, you you'll be sending. Why is Mark Burley doing pretty good this yeah, year? Yeah, I know. You you'll be sending a limo for your catcher to make sure that the catcher shows up. You know, you're gonna get carpal tunnel syndrome yeah. from wiggling your finger so much calling the changeup. <laughs> yeah, and we used to say that. You know, like a pitcher that catcher you know, broke you, his index you, finger. You know, they you were gonna beat their ass. Is like, all right, someone sent a limo to that guy's house or to the hotel. Make sure he makes it to the mound. Okay, make sure he doesn't get hurt. We want him to take the mound because we're going to beat his ass. I thought, it's, the, it's, I it's, thought it's, the people in Boston just <laughs> liked me. No, it just, it, it, you know, it's just something that, you know, you, you have that feeling. And, and, and as, as a, uh, you know, as a team, if you have a pitcher, okay, that, you know, you struggle with, oh, good gracious, you didn't really, yeah, oh, please, we need rain. Somehow or another, you know, rain us out. You know, some of the, it was, and I tell you, you know, the Mets. Did you do good against the Mets? I uh, I own the Mets. I was a Met killer. Yeah, that, it was as left-handers with change-ups while we played. You know, that that you just get them. They you either sink the ball away and you, and you throw the change-up. Um, we got Zane Smith. I mean, it was just to beat the Mets. Bugs Bunny. Randy, Randy Tomlin. Did uh, he really look like Bugs Bunny? Uh, Bugs. He can eat an apple through a picket fence. Uh, I'm pretty sure he had some. He had some chompers on him. Um, let's just say you didn't answer that, that question. Let, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's one of my favorite guys. He is a great Come guy, on, absolutely. I, you know, you know, I'm just, talking about a guy from the just, other side just, of the dugout. We used to make fun of people. Just, just because I'd go to the mountain and say, "Here's, a, I get an extra mask." Uh, you're scaring the little kids in the front row. I didn't want to say that. I have mean, a couple carrots not, in your back pocket. <laughs> it's not nice. And uh, <laughs> I tell you, what, but he, hey, he was almost in my top five. Of, of of favorite guys to catch, he, but I am close. there, and so, you are so, there. So I'm, absolutely, I'm head and shoulders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God! You know what? Uh, another thing I was watching the other day, uh, the game on Fox. They had the Red Sox and Yankees. Which, you know, why are the Red Sox and Yankees still on the Fox game of the week? They're you know they're they're not. The Red Sox aren't in it. All right, maybe I'll give them early enough of the season. Tanaka gives up a 228 foot home run. Uh, to right field against Napoli, Napoli, and he throws it. It's a 96 mile an hour fastball, which registered as his hardest fastball of the night. And now the game's over. You go back to the to the uh, uh, the, the host in the studio, and Sweeney comes out, the ex uh, Kansas City Royal, saying that he never should have thrown that split fingered fastball. Now, if you're going to be the expert. And you're going to be back in the in, in, in the in the studio talking about the game. Don't you think you should at least watch the game? You know, <laughs> pointer. Um, Am I going off limits here by getting on another? Uh, no, 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 no. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm a color analyst. Did you watch I mean, the game? Did yeah, you, did you I, I didn't the see. Same it. Thing? I didn't see it, but you know, I, I heard comments. You know that uh, you know he threw the wrong pitch. Um, you know, I'm going to contend that you know 96 miles an hour. Okay. In the right location is the right pitch. Every pitch, high and away at Yankee it, Stadium, it, it, is not. Again, in the right location. Okay, let's not let's not uh, you know get this this wrong here. Okay, yeah, it, it, maybe a, a a curveball or something would have been better, but to call a 96 mile an hour pitch a split finger, 
But how many guys do you know that throw 96 splits? It, it doesn't happen. It's impossible. I don't, I don't know. What uh, you know, looks I, like. and, and I apologize for the ignorance of the uh, the announcer that uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, said that it was a split finger. I mean, obviously uh, didn't watch. Was uh, maybe looking at uh, you know a, a printout that was given to him. Uh, but you know what? When I get on the air, I want to know what I'm talking about. It's it, it's the game that your network. Is, is is sponsoring? It's the game of the week. That's the one you, your announcers they're talking about, and you're not watching it. Um, and I wanted to talk to you. I said, I said, I want to, you know, ask myself. I said, self, if I have Spanky there tomorrow, how how do you pitch around a guy? Because you've got JD Drew on deck with a one run lead. There's two outs. You've got JD Drew hitting a hundred. How do you pitch around Napoli? Well, what I do is I I go outside uh, four or five inches. And I just throw fastballs. And they they have nobody else on their bench, so they can't pinch run and steal a base. I think the safest way to pitch around Napoli right then is to take that 96 and hit him in the elbow. Well, you hit him in the back. Yeah. We well, hit him in the neck. He's got the he's got the uh, artillery on. He, the, yeah. The no, armor. No, 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 you know, but I mean that's what I remember. Jim Leland, uh, we were facing the Mets, and Daryl Strawberry just absolutely killed us, and uh, we were on orders, you know, for this particular game. Do not throw him a strike, okay? And that's just the way. We're going to pitch around him. We're, it's going to be an unintentional, intentional walk. I'm going to look over there, and, and whether the, the at-bat means something or whatever, and all we're going to do is just try to frustrate him. And our deal was, you know what, Spanky, get off the plate six inches and just call fastballs. You're not worried about hanging a breaking ball. You're not worried about anything. You know, yeah, breaking ball in dirt, yeah, it's easier said than done. Okay, so I call a pitch. Okay, and I go out about six inches, and I, I I don't know if it was Dougie Drabeck on the mound or whoever it was. He throws the pitch and it gets called a strike. Right. Okay. So now I look in the dugout and Leland is absolutely going batshit. Okay. <laughs> he he's already gone through like two lucky strikes in the matter of just that pitch. He just sucked them he, down. He's lighting one he, cigarette with the uh, other cigarette. Yeah, and, and 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 he's going, "What are you doing?" And and now I go to the umpire. I go look. You can't call that a strike, okay? The pitch is way outside. You just got me in trouble with, with, with my manager. And, and now he goes, what, what do you mean? I go, we can't throw this guy a strike because that's our game plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so now, you know, I, I, you know, after the inning's over, I, you know, go over and, and, and uh, you know, the, I tell, you know, I tell Jimmy, I says, look, the umpire – you know, had it in for Strawberry. He thought that I was moving outside so I could give him the old one, two, three, strike three and sit his ass down. Well, we weren't on the same. We, we had different game plans going. <laughs> and as I was saying, here the umpire's going, oh, yeah, they want to stick it up his butt. And now, oh, wow, yeah, but Spanky, I'm getting you in trouble. Yeah, what do you do? Well, I just explained to Jimmy, look, I can't move out any further outside because be, I'm right in the middle of the other batter's box. So uh, you know that was the that was the deal. I always had that theory about pitching around guys, especially from the starting pitcher. If you had good enough stuff to pitch around a hitter, you wouldn't be in that trouble in the first place. And that's why sometimes the easiest way to pitch around a guy is just hit him. Well, uh, yeah, and again, that's and then they're not sure if you're pitching around or not. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, again, you got to look at your pitcher and what he's capable of doing. Uh, yeah, to me, you you, you throw uh, four pitches right at his belt buckle. If he moves out of the way, then you walk him. If he doesn't, well, then you, you saved a couple pitches. But, uh, but you know, again, to me, for, it, it doesn't make sense to pitch around Strawberry outside because he could reach the next block with that swing. Well, uh, again, but, you know, when your manager's Jim Leal and he tells you to do it that way, guess what you do? Did you ever buy him cigarettes? Never. Never. No, no, no. I, I, I think uh, I, at the time, it was back whenever chewing tobacco was, you know, like, uh, you know, rampant in the big leagues, and there was a bunch of guys that smoked cigarettes. And you know, I was just talking to you know about Bob Walk. You know, he goes, you know, going about rituals. You know, in between innings, you know, and the, you know, he's talking to some fans, and he goes, all my rituals, you can't like, I can't say, you know, because you know, hot days he'd go have a beer. Um, you know, on on uh, uh, in between innings, you'd go have a smoke. I mean, <laughs> you can't say those things. But you know, that's just uh, you know, kind of what guys did. And but yeah, you're absolutely right. There's there's things we could talk about that happen in the clubhouse, and we could talk about in the bar afterwards. But there are a lot of things we can't talk about that happen during the game. And and thank God that that will remain sacred. 
All right, we've had another wonderful show here at the Clubhouse Show. My thanks to Mike Lavalier, Chris Stansberry, Fernando Lopez, the whole crowd here at Doc's Grill at the uh, Summerfield Golf Course. We thank you, Jason. Uh, we'll be back again next week, 7 o'clock. Uh, hopefully we got tuned in on uh, YouTube and it went a lot smoother. But uh, thank you once again, and we'll see you next week. Good night.